Hello, bitches. Oh, I didn't put the video. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I work. This is no democracy. It is a dictatorship. Take your cake, take your cake. Double hate. Loathe entirely. You're out of order. You're out of order. Everything that guy just says bullshit. Thank you. Life is cruel. I don't give a f what the deal was. The deal is now changed. Either you stay or you go. It's up to you. End of discussion. We're going to ignore that. Hello, everybody, <laughs> and welcome to YLS. Topic tonight is crime comedies. I'm your host for the evening, not uh, Cody Newberry. Uh, he's not here right now. I'm the, I'm the captain now. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm I'm not even the captain of my own life. Anyway, beside beyond that in crisis, we've got a good panel tonight. Uh, so we'll start off uh, to my right. Uh, we've got Adelaide Spence. Adelaide, do 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 you like crime? Do do you like comedy? I haven't seen you this uncomfortable in months, and it's such a great sight. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fair. That's fair. But do you think you're gonna have a good list tonight? Do I ever? I will say I can't go in fourth place today, which is a big advantage for me. That is fair. That is fair. You cannot get fourth place. You can only get third. So like, that's not bad. Uh, then Scott, Scott, you are you gonna pick Band Slam tonight? <laughs> are you gonna work the mu the music in that as a crime? Yeah. And oh wow, it's you went such there. Comedy that it is a crime. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to think if any crimes are committed, maybe at some point, but no, I don't think Bansom will be appearing. To be honest with you, I uh, I think I have a pretty basic list tonight. Um, usually, I I have like one or two wild cards in there. I might have one tonight, but um, I think I have a pretty basic list for this topic. But look, I'm. I aim to continue my track record of every episode I've been on that uh, Cody has not hosted, I have won. Every single episode I've been on that Cody has hosted, I've come in last place. There's really no in-between. So. That is go. fair. That is fair. Uh, so we'll see how you do with my hosting. Jake! Yes. Jake, uh, you have been on once before. You had a weird, weird list last time. We'll see how you do tonight. <laughs> How, how are you feeling? I uh, I didn't think it was a weird list. I was just making my personal favorites, and uh, yeah, I guess it was controversial or something. I, I don't know. <laughs> Phantom of the Paradise. You guys seen that? It's a great movie. I, I don't know. I don't know what uh, Cody spoken. It's uh, yeah. That that is the actual best way to have a reaction to your insane list is. I don't think it's insane. This is the most normal thing ever that out. justifies every reaction. Is it an insane list? Like, I don't know. Here, here's the advantage. Like all three of us, we don't make lists for the hoax. We make them for the, for ourselves. It's an That's equal playing field today. True. <laughs> true. Uh, so uh, the order will go. We'll go Adelaide, Scott, Jay. As the show works, we go ten, nine, eight, seven to four, three, three, two, two, one, one. So we will start off, Spence. You want to give us your 10, 9, 8? Absolutely. So my number 10 is Dope. My number 9 is Game Nights. And my number 8 is Raising Arizona. Damn. All right. Oh, uh, Craig, you're supposed to say yikes. Yeah, I, 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 I went, uh, <laughs> I made a click noise. <laughs> oh, yeah, yikes. Uh, there you go. Just, just erasing yeah, this is not hereditary. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> All right, yeah. Uh, dope is uh, pretty dope. Uh, I, I think earlier on, I'm, I'm going to see like like weirder, like, I don't know. I think crime as a genre is super interesting because it's both, it's a lot of everything if you think about it. And for me, this is the example of just like, oh, yeah, this is a crime film because there, you know, dealing drugs and escaping a, a potential murder. But it's also just like this really fun homage and send up to 80s culture and love, even from this younger, like modern perspective. And he gets, one, one of my favorite scenes of the movie is he literally gets schooled by 80s culture from someone older than him. And it's like, you didn't live this. You don't know what you're going through. You're seeing the classics. You didn't, you didn't see all the real shit that made the classics. 
And that's all against the backdrop of just like this really fun and funny ensemble, just embracing the weirdness of modern culture as well as just dealing with all of the crime. Like I think I think this is like this is my ten because I see it more of a comedy than a crime film. But I wanted to sneak it on here anyways because apparently not everyone has seen it, so I wanted to shout it out. Uh, Game night fucking rocks. Uh, I, I will remember uh, when I came out of this. I was there was a there was a thing going on in 2018, where where I think a lot of us realized like oh, a lot of these films, like have effort put into them. Where like we're used to these very stale one note like, sloppily put together comedies. And every everyone I, I wish I uh, had the director <coughs> written down, but the director and the cinematography really created this really unique perspective on the comedy and added layer and depth to it on top of like an incredible performance from Rachel McAdams. And the entire cast is amazing. Even um, fucking the prince from Aladdin, but like the shitty new one. Billy Magnuson. Uh, Billy, Billy Magnuson. Oh yeah. <laughs> just plays this absolute dumbass to perfection. And again, great scenes like, yes, you have, you have like the very, again, like the idea of like elevating comedy of the one shot thrown around the Fabergé egg in the, in the mansion. And then him just like, I got three quarters. Yeah. So, uh, starting with Dope, uh, Dope was one of my favorite first time watches of last year. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I don't think of it as like a crime comedy, but like, you're right. There is like that crime element in there. Like, so this is probably like the perfect spot for it. This was a great movie. Uh, I, I of course relate to the, the film that is very much about nerds who just love talking about old things. Like, of course, I'm going to love that movie. Uh, but no, this one's super fun. Uh, more people need to see it because this one was great. Uh, then Game Night. I think Game Night is a movie where the parts are better than the actual whole. I think this has a lot of great individual things. Rachel McAdams is, of course, very funny. Uh, that The egg scene is great. Jesse Plemons steals every scene he's in. But I think the actual movie, when it comes together, has a lot of weak moments. It still has that kind of Apatowish sheen that I don't really like, that I feel like kind of bleeds into like a lot of just modern comedies, uh, where it just kind of, it has that kind of, oh, we're all just gonna, you gotta say something funny, because it's got this kind of, still that improv style. So, I don't love Game Night like everyone else does, but I do think this one is like good. It's solid. Uh, I think people just kind of blow it out of proportion. Scott, your ten nine eight. All right, uh, my number ten is Hustlers. My number nine, Sneakers. And my number eight is The Nice Guys. All right. I uh, thought there might be eggs on that, but no. Uh, Hustlers is my number 10. I remember when this movie came out, I was like, that doesn't look good. Um, and I mean, J-Lo hadn't been in a movie, had been in a good movie in like 20 years. Um, but uh, yeah, then I went to, I just kept hearing great things about it. And I was like, do I really have to see this? And like three weeks into its uh, run, I went and saw it and I was like, okay, wow. Like this is a freaking Scorsese movie. Like that's really what it feels like when you're watching. It just has like this, that energy about it that I feel like um, Scorsese has. And um, it's really like contemporary. Like there's some interesting ideas about like capital capitalism and, um, you know, the way that um, modern culture is, um, you know, engineered and some interesting, like I said, interesting ideas. The last line of this movie, like, will really make you think like it's a great mic drop of a last line. Uh, just go look it up. I don't want to, you know, butcher it because I probably can't say it word for word. Perfect. But great performances. JLo is obviously just like owns the screen when she's on screen. That first scene when she comes out and does the dance to the Fiona Apple song is just like epic. Um, and so I think Hustlers is a great time and people should give it a chance. Uh, sneakers. I just watched this one last week for the first time. Um, and yeah, this movie is a ton of fun. I mentioned this in my letterbox uh, post on it, but I should have probably watched this earlier because this was the movie my parents saw on their first date. Um, and so I owe my life to the movie Sneakers, I guess, um, because it's it's hard to imagine watching this movie and not just coming out of it with a smile on your face. It's that type of movie. It has a, a, a fantastic ensemble between um, 
why can I not think of anybody now? Robert Redford, Dan Aykroyd, Sidney Poitier, uh, Ben Kingsley plays the villain. Um, it's just a really fun movie. And what I really like about it is that the characters aren't really using like futuristic technology or anything like that to like accomplish their goals. They're really using their ingenuity and actually some very like uh, obsolete technology, like, at least when you view it nowadays to, to achieve their goals. So I think it's cool to watch the movie nowadays and see, um, you know, a movie about smart people um figuring stuff out using their smarts uh, and that's what i think sneaker is sneakers is and the nice guys uh is another one that i actually just watched this year for the first time and wow i was really sleeping on this movie um mainstream comedies are like not always like something that appeal to me but this movie it just has that that special something um and I, maybe it's shane black's writing I'm, i am a fan of him um my, my match with Brian Michaels might uh, confuse you and thinking I'm not a fan of him, but I am. Um, I enjoyed uh, I enjoy his movies quite a bit. Um, and yeah, I think Ryan Gosling like I, I, is one of those actors like I am not a fan of his dramatic work, but I like could not love his comedic work more. Like I think he just needs to just do comedies forever because I think he's hysterical. I love the bit about like stop saying and stuff that he has with his daughter and Angry Rice is, you know, delightful as well as the daughter. Um, so this is when I want to rewatch again soon because it's one of my favorite first time watches of 2021. Yeah, uh, Hustlers, uh, it was the 10. So it was a low priority for me to see. So I still haven't seen it. I uh, heard it's good though. Uh, sneakers is great. Sneakers is a lot of fun. Uh, David Strathern. Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention that. He steals every scene he's in. Uh, I, I love him in this movie. He's probably my favorite part of it. But the whole cast is great. It's very fun. It's been a little bit since I've seen it, but I remember really enjoying it the first time I watched it. And I've been meaning to revisit it. It was great, though. Uh, the Nice Guys, uh, this one's excellent. Nice Guys is fantastic. Uh, I love The Nice Guys. I watch the movie a lot. Uh, Gosling should have, to me, Caleb Coho's not listening, and I don't care even if he was. This is the better 2016 Ryan Gosling performance. Uh, this is the best lead performance of 2016, in my opinion. This is the one Whoa. he should have been. Lead actor, I should say. Uh, this is the one he should have been nominated for. And if he was nominated for this, I would have given him the win. Uh, he is great in this. He and Crow work off each other so well. Um, you can't even say Barishnikov. <laughs> one of like the great little moments in that movie. Whole film is excellent. I love like the Shane Black crime comedy. He has two, and they're both excellent. I go back and forth which one I like more, but I think I like the nice guys a little bit more than Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Uh, so now we'll go over to Jake for your ten nine eight. At number ten, I have Cotton Comes to Harlem. At number nine, I have A Shot in the Dark. And at number eight, I have Crimes and Misdemeanors. I am so shocked. No one yikes. It, though. <laughs> uh, okay, so Cotton Comes to Harlem. I just saw this one like a week ago, and I like, oh, I want to talk about this. So I, that's, I, I, I love this movie. Uh, I put it on. This is a 1970 movie, so technically before the genre of the black exploitation really took off, uh, Shaft in 1971 is really considered the first one uh but i put this on thinking it was a pretty straight um you know uh cop movie or or something and uh pretty early on in the movie it became clear that uh there was something else tonally going on where um uh so they're they're shaking a guy up and then they they throw him in the air and a, a mannequin goes flying in the air and it's just this really heightened thing and uh then uh, you get this great shootout sequence that's uh it, incredibly well shot and and uh, then a car chase but then in the middle of a car chase they start cutting two pedestrians on the street doing like vaudevillian like um like really big uh, obnoxious comedy bits where uh you have a uh, a mortician walk out and like straighten his tie because of how dangerous the the car chase is going and you have a guy who's uh hitting on some girls get interrupted by this car chase and and uh i just found the whole movie just kind of a, a, a blast. Uh, specifically, though, uh, Godfrey Cambridge, he plays a grave digger. Grave digger and coffin are the name of the uh, two police officers. And uh, this grave digger character, 
the way his eyes shift around constantly, it's just magnetic. Uh, at one point, a, a white cop uh, says, um, just just subtly, it's a subtle thing, but he says, uh, your people or something, or, or you people or something, and you just see his eyes shift over to his partner, and he shifts back, and it's just something, and it's not, it's not, it's clearly wasn't for white audiences at the time, but they would pick up on that. So uh, I'd really recommend that. It's on the Criterion channel right now. <laughs> At number nine, I have A Shot in the Dark, uh, the sequel to The Pink Panther. This one's uh, one my dad showed me. I won't spend too much time on it. But uh, so uh, Peter Sellers was the, uh, Inspector Clouseau was the breakout character uh, rather than David Niven. David, it was, the original Pink Panther was a David Niven vehicle. And Peter Sellers was clearly like the uh, best part. So the sequel, they just made it all about Inspector Clouseau. And so the same year that the Pink Panther or that A uh, Shot in the Dark comes out, you also have uh, Dr. Strangelove. So I really feel like 1964 in a weird way is kind of, it's kind of like the uh, Peter Sellers set the tone for like what like SNL style comedy movies would be for the next like, you know, uh, like 30 or 40 years uh, with like playing every character in one and then being this uh, crazy uh, French character who is bumbling around everything and the rest of the world around him is very serious. And you can look at Mike Myers' career and uh, and Sandler and, and Will Ferrell and it's like Eddie Murphy and they're all kind of playing off of Peter Sellers, his two movies in 1964, which I think is interesting. And now Crimes and Misdemeanors. This one is directed by a monster, of course. Uh, I hesitated to put it on the list, but it's my favorite uh, of this monster's massive filmography. Uh, I think a lot of, I don't really like, oh, crime comedies. Yeah, uh, <laughs> this is a crime movie and a comedy, okay? Uh, you, half of it is a crime movie. I'm, I feel like that comedy. comment was probably referring to a shot in the dark because Cody hates that movie. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yes. So the thing about uh, crimes and misdemeanors is Woody Allen always wants to do uh, his dramas and his comedies, and he's always trying to uh, mix them together like that terrible Melinda and Melinda. Uh, this is one where it works. One of the plots is about a murder, and one of them is your standard uh, Woody Allen romantic comedy, and he's constantly cutting between the two. Uh, Martin Landu is the guy who wants to kill his mistress. But the thing I love about it is that it doesn't try too hard to draw parallels between these two plot lines. It lets you just do it yourself. It, it, you're making the connections between what is going on in these two very different stories. And it isn't too cute with trying to connect them. They only meet for a brief moment at the end of the movie. And that's why it looks good. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it uh, kind of comes to Harlem. I have not seen you actually kind of sold me on it, though, in your description. I, I do kind of want to see it, though, now. Uh, it's on Criterion Channel, so I'll probably check it out. A Shot in the Dark. I think you picked the wrong Pink Panther movie. The Ooh. original Pink Panther would also have been the wrong Pink Panther movie to pick. I don't think the Pink Panther movies get good until you get into the 70s. That's mm -hmm. when you get... Like, you mean? Scott... <laughs> You're on thin ice, buddy. Scott wants one. <laughs> remember, remember this? This, is, this affects grades. You know, you're, you're going down a grade just for, for thinking that. <laughs> Whatever I had you at, you're, you're down one. Oh, like no. one spot. Try to earn it back. <laughs> but no, uh, I, I don't think those movies get good until you get to the 70s. Uh, mm. And the best one is Pink Panther Strike. Again, that one's really funny. I just it is really shot funny. the dark feels very basic. It's like, hey, yes. let's do the first one, but actually focus it more around like Clouseau. Strikes mm. again is where you get crazy with it, and you have all the world's assassins coming after Clouseau. But I think yeah, the right. The the sequence where he's avoiding getting uh, yeah. killed. By, uh, yeah, yeah. And you have like Deep Roy in there. That one's great. This one's. Eh. Uh, and then Crimes and Misdemeanors, I watched uh, two days ago, uh, and I was a little disappointed. I was a little bit disappointed by Crimes and Misdemeanors. Uh, I was really looking forward to it, because despite the fact he's a terrible person, I like a lot of his scripts. 
I think he's a good writer. Uh, this one didn't quite gel for me. I feel like the two parts kind of clash and just, it was like, as soon as I was getting interested in one of the stories, it would kind of cut over and then it would be a block of, oh, I'm, I don't really care again. And then I would care about that one. I just felt like it, the timing of when we were in certain areas just didn't work. The parts I like, Martin Landau is great when you get into like the last half hour. When you get into his like monologue with Alan, that scene is great. And Alan Alda is yes. so <laughs> yeah. funny in this movie. Yeah. Alan Alda is great in this, which is Perfect not hard. I say a lot. Alan Alda is normally just Alan Alda, and he is kind of he's playing the Alan Alda type, but then you kind of realize he is actually really a douchebag. He's super funny in this. Uh, but overall, movie didn't quite gel altogether. Now the gloves come off. Everyone gets to comment on everybody's. Uh, we're gonna start with Spence. Your seven. Oh, sir. Uh, I, I'm I'm glad that my seven is starting with a movie that everyone loves. That everyone has like an affinity for these movies. I'm of course I'm of course picking the Great Muppet Caper. Uh, I think the third best Muppet film. Like it's up there. I, I I adore this. Earlier this year, I did like a Muppets binge trying to get through them all. And this one is just the one that really surprised me. Could never hear anyone like really speaking about it. And I just got around to it and every joke just landed with me. I thought the cast was absolutely phenomenal. I think they utilize the Muppets actually really well in this film. They give all of the stars like a really like a place to shine in the narrative, as well as I think shaking up their positions, at least in comparison to the other ones enough that I get really engaged. Namely, I think I think Miss Piggy has like this great just character in this going from like this, like wanting to be like this assistant who wants to go for the top to just assuming her boss's position and then just being abs, fuck you, Cody. Just fucking hilarious. <laughs> uh, I don't have a lot of words to say about this, but it's, I, I love the Muppets and this is a great movie from them. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that if you look at like the original run of the the first three Muppet movies, right? You have the first one, which is like a very sentimental love letter to the Muppets, right? But you still have like some fun comedy. This one goes for more of a farce. It goes for more of the fourth wall jokes, more like ridiculous, crazy jokes. And that has some pluses and some minuses. But I do find this one funny. I love the Muppets in general. So like, this is always going to hit for me. Uh, the person who steals... A lot of this movie is Charles Grodin. Charles Grodin is the villain in this. We lost Charles Grodin way too soon. Uh, and I wish he would have been doing more work because, as in his older age, because he was always funny. Charles Grodin is just like you look at him in like real life or you look at him in The Heartbreak Kid, you look at him in all these movies, and he's hilarious and he's great in this as well. He, he knows the exact pitch to play to not make it too over the top. But still, like, he's doing a Muppet movie. Uh, there's also a real fun moment uh, with uh, John Cleese that is just hilarious with them in his house. That one is super funny. Uh, I, I love this one a lot. Uh, this is probably the third best Muppet movie, I'd say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Scott, Jake, thoughts on The Great Muppet Keeper? Haven't seen it, sorry. You, uh, I, I love that a Kermit and uh, Fozzie play twin brothers uh, in this. Uh, that's this is the one, right? Yeah. Kermit, uh, Fozzie, and Gonzo are all triplets. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's uh, that's uh, yeah. This is probably me. I would say maybe my full. Like, what? What are we? The original Muppets movie, Muppets Christmas Carol. Then Muppets Take Manhattan, and then twenty eleven. Yeah, twenty years. <laughs> Oof. Oof, twenty no twenty eleven. Pardon? No twenty eleven. Oh, no twenty eleven. I actually like the uh, second M Muppets Most Wanted more than the uh, twenty eleven one. <laughs> Is that a hot take? Oh, I like it. it, it Bowman's looking for the U R on trial. My rating's only going higher today. <laughs> <laughs> That'll work. It's more of a classic Muppets movie. That's what I, it feels like. It feels like. 
the the 2011 Muppets was all meta and oh remember the Muppets and now when we got to most oh, wanted because it was... the Muppets have never been meta. Ooh, <laughs> oh whoa, oh it's not like they're literally yeah. a song where they sing to the camera. Hey, it's a little a different. Movie. That's the opening song of the Great Muppets. The Muppets, oh, the Muppets, Muppets don't have never star. Been meta. The, the problem How is the Muppets feel to aren't know the. You will always be the third most famous Jesus community. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go by Jacob from now on. Is that just? Uh, uh -oh. Yeah. I was like, like Jacob. Jacob. <laughs> The, the issue with the Muppets 2011 is that the Muppets aren't the main character of they're they're like they're it's they're like the, they're playing the Han Solo part almost. Bowman just I'm the host of the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's Anyways, like in a, it's like a Lego sequel thing where it's like, oh, we got to meet the Muppets, like you know. It's it, it, I mean it's it, it's like a sequel and a reboot where it's like you're reintroducing yourself to the characters, and then you, when you get Muppets Most One, it's like yeah, they're the lead characters, but it doesn't take away from like fucking puppet Sheldon Cooper is still like an interesting enough character, which is hard to pull off by creating a new Muppet, having him be engaging. That is I think, difficult. I, I think it's I think it's very good too. I just prefer Most Wanted personally. Fair enough. Uh, Spence, wow, mobs. not uh, <laughs> dead. Uh, you're sick. My six, uh, I might be cheating again. I don't know. We'll see. Is Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Uh, once again, playing fast and loose with the crying bit because uh, I wanted to get a great movie on the show. And yeah, this is maybe my favorite, favorite Coen Brothers film. It's very close. I think they, they just created a really fun, like the Coen Brothers probably do. They, they created a really fun ensemble of characters and give them a lot of, like a big world to go around with. And I think that's the important part of this film. It's not just characters who are stuck in the same thing and are, and are doing the same shtick over and over. They keep meeting new characters and reacting to their environment differently and creating like these levels of comedy as well as creating great music. And if people see people argue this as like a musical, that, that might be why I love it so much. But they, they have just, like they create this amazing, you feel in the place and seeing them go around the state, country, whatever. Just it's there's a there's there's a lot to love in this film. And again, I don't have much to defend the crime bit of it, but I think from a comedy perspective, while also being on the crime genre on IMDb, uh, it's a great film. Uh, yeah, I I don't quite know what you're getting at. I think this is absolutely a crime comedy. Uh, it's literally, they are escaping from, they have escaped from prison at the beginning of the movie. Uh, I, this is like one of the first movies I think of when I think of crime comedies. Uh, and yeah, this one's absolutely hilarious. I love the dynamic between, uh, Ulysses and Delmar. Uh, and I, I just think, I, just the, the opening introduction and then you get to, to Clooney jumping on the train. Are any of you boys Smithies? Or perhaps maybe you were Smithies and then uh, unfortunate circumstances force you to be in this position. I just think that sums up so much about Ulysses as a character. Even when he has his two friends running beside the train. Well, he's chained to them. He's still going to like be very like fanciful in his vernacular. I love that so much. I love Ulysses as a character. I love the whole uh, cast of this movie. John Goodman uh, steals this every scene he's in as the, the Bible salesman. Big Dan Teague. Uh, and uh, you have... Uh, I love that the the sheriff is kind of representative of, like, the devil in this case. Because you uh, hear Tommy say that oh like describe the devil as a white guy with like fire in his eyes and then you see the reflection of the sheriff and he's got the fire in the goggles that like that's kind of who he's supposed to be i love that little piece of foreshadowing i love this apparently my internet is still crapping out according to cody so i'm gonna leave and come back again scott your thoughts on scott jake your thoughts on where we're at uh yeah, I uh, Tim Blake Nelson is uh, so good in this movie that uh, you would uh, he he kind of created this image for him where it's like oh yeah like Tim Blake Nelson is like uh, he's like this southern idiot or whatever and it's like 
No, he's like a a, uh, a Jewish New Yorker who studied at Brown and Juilliard. Like he, he is not this character at all, like at all. Uh, he's like, a, you know, a, you see him in interviews, and it's like, oh, this guy's kind of an intellectual. Like you, you wouldn't expect it just because he's so freaking good in this movie. Uh, yeah, so that's my uh, my take on uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Perfect movie, honestly. Uh, early digital photography too, but. Uh, one of the first to get it right, you know? Yeah, I watched this a long time ago uh, and I had a fun time with it when I did. Um, it was not one that I had ever wanted to revisit really though until recent years. Um, and now again, that I hear people talk about it, I'm like, yeah, I probably missed something back then when I watched this movie um, because I did have a good time, like I said. Um, the other thing I will note just because it's relevant um, here is that I limited myself to one per director or directing team, I suppose in this instance uh, for my lists. So just take That's a make of that what you will. Yeah. Who, who told you to do that? I didn't tell you to do that. <laughs> wait, okay, wait, wait. So you pick a Coen Brothers crime comedy and you don't have this or Raising Arizona? Correct. Go fuck yourself. Hmm. <laughs> well, well, then that, that leaves pretty obvious. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Spence, I need you to narc on people. Did anyone say this sucks while I was gone? No, Jake apparently knows how Tim Blake Nelson was raised, knows his whole life story, though, which I think is pretty interesting. No, I, I just think it's interesting <laughs> that he studied at Brown and Juilliard, and he's a New Yorker. You think this guy's like a Southern idiot, and it's like, no. He's, uh, you watch him in interviews, and all right. uh, sorry, Sam, sorry if I, I pretended that I knew. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> That's fair. Spencer, your five? My five would probably be the thumbnail when this goes on YouTube. Uh, it's Knives Out. It was not the thumbnail when this goes on YouTube. The hot buzz is the thumbnail. That is also fair. Uh, but no, Knives Out is, fuck you, Cody, in the chat. <laughs> Knives Out is incredible. Uh, I'm not going to be Caleb Coho and call it the greatest original screenplay of the decade. But I think that it does so much well. And I, I never, I don't, I didn't really grow up on whodunit type films. Uh, like uh, mystery films have never been like my forte. But walking into this and just having like a love for Ryan Johnson from Brick and Luke, I'm like, okay, this this should be pretty great. And I was blown away almost immediately. He he weaves just like this incredible narrative that is just laced with like incredible humor, namely from Daniel Craig and Chris Evans, but the whole cast has these great shining moments of comedy. On top of like this incredible he he balances the tone really, really well, which with this, with with the dourness and the dark turn the story takes you, it was is extremely difficult, but he pulls it all off amazingly. Uh, and that's, that's, and I lost my train of thought. Uh, this is a great movie. Daniel uh, Craig. Film. Yeah, comedy, yes. Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. And I, I think like for me, the, the big elevation for this film, and like spoilers for anyone who hasn't seen it, uh, the way they reveal the killer could be the most obvious pick of like the entire cast, like, oh yeah, it has to be this guy. But the way that Johnson takes it, says, oh, this is him, and then makes you believe this isn't him, and then turns it around, and like, no, this is, this is him, and it shocks you, is proof to how amazing of a writer he is. Uh, yeah, this is like one of the great non-twists in a movie. Like, I don't know how any way to describe it other than that, in that it's a twist in that like it's obviously like we know what it's going to be but the movie does such a good job at convincing you that it can't be uh it reminds me of a different agatha christie adaptation that does the same thing very well but i don't want to say it because i feel like that could spoil that thing if people aren't familiar with it uh so i i won't say that but this th I, I love this movie I do agree with Cody's sentiments. Higher than Oh Brother Where Art Thou is a little insane, but also no one else had Oh Brother Where Art Thou, so you get more of a pass than everyone else. <laughs> but, I, I, I'll also, I've been meaning to rewatch Oh Brother, so that I, 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 I can be why it's slower. You don't need to rewatch it. It's great. I mean, you can rewatch it because it's great, but it's great. You should have it higher. It should be your one. <laughs> uh, no. uh, Nags Out is very well written the way it kind of blends between being like a murder mystery movie and then it goes to being like this more crime film style really works 
Uh, I love the, the comedy in this. Uh, Coho and I, Coho always quotes, I will not eat one iota of shit. Michael Shannon <laughs> hilarious. And everyone is actually has at least one really funny line. Uh, I think maybe my favorite line in the movie is, I read a tweet about a New Yorker article about it. Uh, <laughs> and that... It's just a great line. Tony Collette is just hilarious in this movie. I'm pretty sure she's playing Gwyneth Paltrow. That's just like... Yeah. <laughs> That's a good call. But she does have her own brain. She could have created Goob. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Scott, Jake, thoughts on Knives Out? Another another line I like is Lakeith Stanfield going, that was the dumbest car chase of all time. Um, th- this movie's great. Um, I... Uh, this came up recently when, on the mystery thriller episode and the last one that I was on. Um, and so I, you know, I won't restate much except to say, I really like the political commentary also sort of about like xenophobia. Um, you know, especially when you have a Hispanic actress playing the, the lead in Ana de Armas, I think uh, it comes across really strongly. It makes that final shot all the more satisfying and it's already pretty satisfying. So uh, big fan of this movie, big fan of Ryan Johnson. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I I really liked this movie, and uh, it was kind of triumphant after all the weird uh, Last Jedi toxicity thing, like where it was like people sending like uh, uh, hate mail and stuff. I, I I hope that uh, Kelly Marie Tran uh, pops up, and is she supposed to pop up in the the Knives Out too? That that would be nice. I, I really like this movie. I don't know. Maybe it could be. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't mind. I I think she's a good actress. I wouldn't mind. Every everyone and their mother is in Knives Out too. Let's be real. Let's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I can't well, keep no, up. No, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, so now, Spence, you're four. Uh, yeah, my four is Baby Driver. Thank you. Uh, so I go from Kalo Co to Cameron Holtzman. Uh, this movie is just amazing. Uh, it it again like the idea of I th- I think a lot of my notes at least for on this show is the balancing of comedy and crime. And taking, honestly, like a really tragic backstory for Baby about everything about everything he went through, and then creating like this incredible soundtrack and like this, like you get you get invested so quickly into this film, as well as creating again like this could also just be like an ensemble list for me, <laughs> like an incredible ensemble of characters where yeah they come in and they get shifted out occasionally, like with uh, bats or the fucking guy who's, who confuses Mike and Michael Myers. And you never, it never misses a beat, even if, even if, even in its referencing and its like retooling of old lines in its script, it adds new layers to them. And this this is one of those films I think that like we've talked about so much as a community. This and Knives Out, so we tend to lose like the specialness of it because everyone's like, oh, it's a perfect movie. But you just sit down and you watch, and you realize, no, this is just incredible. And Edgar Wright's an amazing director, and this is I. This is just amazing. I I like Baby Driver. Crime comedy is a weird descriptor for this movie. Uh, I think of it as a crime film. I think of it as an action film. I don't really. Th- I think it's a movie with funny moments. I think it is a movie that has funny things in it. I don't at all think of it really as a comedy. Uh, I, I like the movie. It's a good movie. I think the fact that you have it higher than Knives Out, Oh Brother Where Art Thou, and Raising Arizona is a little bit crazy, especially because I think all those movies are funnier and are just better crime movies, too. I'm a like, child. What do you expect? Love. What did you say to me? I'm a child. What do you expect? Oh, I think you said <laughs> I was a child. And I, I was... But no, you're yes, you are a child. Like you're you're basically twelve in terms of this community. Like Whoa. the only person younger than you is Cameron Holzman because he is Hey, 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 put the respect on like four year old Jack Pinchuk, okay. That is actually you're right, you're right. Well, no, because Jack Pinchuk also just likes really weird movies sometimes. But yeah. Anyway, that's not important. Scott Jake. Thoughts. Uh, why? Why didn't you have Baby Driver? Like, clearly, one of the greatest comedies of all time. Oh. Uh, 
Go ahead, Jake. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. I thought this – until you said, hey, this isn't really a comedy, I, I was like, oh, yeah, of course Baby Driver is a crime comedy. Then you think about it and you're like, oh, it's actually not. Yeah, it, it's the same genre as as whatever Reservoir Dogs and, and – is Pulp Fiction a comedy? Like, kind of? Uh, like, it's in that area, that gray zone. where. So, I don't know. I have more questionable ones on my list than that coming up, so I don't want to push too hard on that. But, uh, yeah. I, I don't uh, know. I love this movie. It's a great movie. I don't know. It's a crime comedy, sure. Edgar Wright makes funny movies. <laughs> yeah, I enjoy it a lot. Um, I don't think it's a comedy. Um and also, you know, I, like I said, I do, I do enjoy it a lot. Um, but I like, there's not been an Edgar Wright movie that I haven't liked at the same time. There's not been one that I like loved until maybe until this year and the Sparks Brothers' his documentary. But um, I, uh, I think this movie is, is, uh, is still a lot of fun. I don't know that it really fits, but um, it's great. There hasn't, so no, Hot Fuzz, World's End. I get it. Some people don't like Scott Pilgrim, but that—that's. I like it. I like them all. Like I said, I like them all. I just don't love any of them. Well, they don't love you either, Scott. What's your? <laughs> they probably don't. Uh, my number seven is uh, American Psycho. Um, I think this movie is fantastic. Um. This one might be a controversial take. I think this is the better version of what David Fincher was trying to do with Fight Club um, because I think this is just a smarter uh, critique of like materialism. I think Fincher's movie comes too close to like glamorizing what it's depicting. Um, I don't think you get that in American Psycho. It's a, it's brutal. Um, you know, obviously the the violence um, is pretty shocking and, you know, this movie was close to getting a NC-17, but um yeah, at the same time, it's you know it's very satirical. Um, that's why I think it fits in the the comedic vibe. I and mean, Christian Bale's performance is so deliberately over the top. Um, again, I think to, it, it's it's just a fascinating movie about like what happens when you apply the way that we consume goods to like people to human human beings. Um, and uh, I think this is probably like Christian Bale's. This is probably his best performance for me. Um, I think he uh, just hits the tone perfectly of what he's going for with this performance. Um, and it's so watchable, even though he's despicable, right? Like you can't stop watching him. Um, and I think uh, Mary Heron, uh, I think this movie benefited from having a female director, um, given that it, the guy who wrote the, the book is one of the more toxic male uh, authors of the last 30 years, Brady Sinellis. But um, I think uh, this movie is excellent. Um, and yeah, I like it a lot. I think that much like Fight Club, this is a movie that was ruined by its obsessive fans uh, who act like the movie is significantly better than it is. Is Christian Bale great in the film? Absolutely. He should have been nominated for an Oscar. This is one, like, probably Christian Bale's best performance pre-2007. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, pre-2007, pre-I'm Not There, this is Bale's best performance. Uh, I just think that this movie gets, it's, it gets a little, obviously, like, it's a movie that is very much trying to capture, like, the 80s yuppie culture, but after a point, like, I just get sick of listening to Patrick Bateman. I just get tired of it, and I just think when we actually get into, like, the dynamic when – I love Willem Dafoe, but when Kimball actually shows up, I think that's when the movie kind of goes down, and it actually – when it actually becomes a crime film and, like, the actual detective trying to know, I think that's when the movie like, takes a bit of a sh sharp turn. Uh, Spence, what are you talking about in the, in the private chat? I, I like <laughs> I enjoy Jason Bateman. What what is your problem? <laughs> you know what? Now whatever grade I was gonna give you, that's below because I love Jason Bateman. Well, we're not getting Cody. You oh, you think you just get a pass by getting yelled at? No, no, I bring you down grades. If you make if you look at me the wrong way. Put the bunny back in the freaking box, you 
<laughs> oh, oh, that Bateman. Never mind. Well, <laughs> I didn't know if it was a bit or not. I was like, surely he knows what we're talking about. I don't know. I'll, I'll figure it out if it's a bit later. That's 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 my job. Uh, but yeah, uh, Jake, Adelaide, thoughts on American Psycho? Go ahead. Ah. Uh, yeah, I uh, I loved American Psycho uh, a lot. In I still like this movie, but I, I loved this movie in high school, and I found that when I revisited it, it was uh, not quite as uh, deep as I remembered anyways. Uh, I just felt like, uh, like I still think it is one of Christian Bale's best performances, and it's totally mesmerizing. But really, what this movie's about is, like, aren't Wall Street people, like, vapid consumerist, uh, like, psychos that uh, could get away with anything and, and you would never notice? And I'm like, oh, my God, like, so poignant. And, uh, like, it's, it's, not, it's not quite as uh, probing as I, I used to think it was, uh, I don't think. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's just me. I don't know. There's a handful of films out there. When you look at me, you're like, oh, they must hate this. But I fucking love American Psycho. Uh, I, I, it's, I, I, again, a bit of hypocrite. Uh, I don't think it's that much of a comedy, but I think with me having Baby Driver, I think I, like, I lose one, so I can, I can only pick on you for like your next few. But I think like this is a fantastic film, a great crime film. I think that this whole balancing of did he or didn't he is a great sort of tightrope walk of just... Uh, What's the word? A, 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 a untruthful narrator, whatever the actual word for it is. Unreliable. Unreliable, Unreliable thank you. Un unreliable. And <laughs> I, I think this is a great film. I wouldn't, have, I, I, mean, I might have picked it if I saw it as a comedy, but I think as a film, solid, solid pick. Fair enough. Uh, Scott, we're going to go to your six. All right, my six is the dark comedy Thoroughbreds. Um, I, this was a, a movie that I, um, found to be really underrated when it was released. Um, Corey Finley, uh, I think is a really, um, promising young director, bad education. His recent film is also really strong, but, um, this movie is just a great sort of psychological dark comedy about, uh, another movie about rich people. Um, we've talked about quite a few here, but, um, in this in this case the rich people are two girls played by Anya Taylor Joy and Olivia Cook um, who decide that they're going to basically cuz they're bored and rich they're going to kill um, Anya Taylor Joy's kind of douchebag stepfather who's played by Paul Sparks in very <laughs> a very effective performance he's wearing like vineyard vines like jackets and visors like it's it's a perfect look they they styled him perfectly in this movie but um, yeah and it uh, it's it's just a really uh, susp it, it becomes really suspenseful. Like Anton Yelchin um, also appears. It's his last movie as a, a kind of local lowlife um, who provides him with a gun. Um, and like it becomes really suspenseful down the stretch when they're actually trying to go through with their plan. Um, and I just think the, I find the character arcs of the two main characters really interesting as well because you definitely start off with your perception of. Lily, which is Anya Taylor Joy's character, being really well like put together, you know, and having having every uh, being on top of everything, and um, Olivia Cook, uh, Amanda being like the crazy one because she did a crazy thing in her past, granted. Um, but your perspective really starts to shift over the course of the movie, and I think uh, the movie forces you to ask a lot of questions in, at the end about, well, who who really was the crazier one all along? Um, and I think that the like there's some really haunting images um, and the way that they finally staged the part where they may or may not go through with the killing. Again, I don't want to spoil it, but the way that that is shot and the image that sort of finishes out that sequence um, is not one that's going to leave you soon. So I love Thoroughbreds. Uh, yeah, uh, I think I thought Thoroughbreds was great. I watched this because Legalese uh, used Anya Taylor-Joy against what's for us finest. Uh, so I had to watch this. That's true. Uh, and no, Thoroughbreds was great. Uh, this movie's excellent. The one thing I'm going to dig on a little bit, though, is 
I don't think of this as a comedy. I think this is a movie that has funny moments, but if you're going to call Baby Driver not a comedy, I don't think Thoroughbreds is a comedy. Either. I think it's a dark comedy, but yeah. I think it has darkly comic moments. I wouldn't call it. I didn't. I found myself more tense than I was laughing most of the time. Uh, I, I just don't generally think of this one as a comedy. But I thought it was excellent. Olivia Cook is incredible in this movie. I don't know why. Like, it feels like besides this and Mineral and the Dying Girl, like, you look at, like, Ready Player One, it just feels like Olivia Cook has to take a lot of, like, basic roles. I think she's a way more talented actress than that, and I want to see her do more things. So I think she could be, like, one of the best actresses of the next decade. Uh, but, yeah, overall, Thoroughbred's really a movie. You're fine. Or, no, no, we go to Spence. How does this show work? Yeah. Spence and Jake look out on Thoroughbred's. So, I, I think Scott used the right word for this. Underrated. Not great, just underrated. I think people slept on it, and, like, it's better than people gave it, but it's not, like, this amazing film. I do I do think it loses itself in its tone a little bit, that it tries to balance with the comedy. Like, I do think it's a comedy, but I don't think it all hits very well. I think it's I think its tone shifts are too drastic, and I just I, I was le- I left the theater very just okay with it. And as as Larry did more, was like I, I I've I've gotten like better feelings about it, but it's still not amazing. Uh, yeah, I I haven't seen this one yet, but you definitely uh, sold me on it. I added it to my uh, list on Letterbox. There, that sounds great. Yeah. Okay, okay Scott, you're five. Uh, okay, I think we can all agree this is a crime comedy. The Grand Budapest Hotel. <laughs> um, yeah, this is... This, so I actually did not like this movie when I first watched it. And I, I'm a, kind of hot and cold on Wes Anderson in general. But the second time I went back and rewatched it, I was like, what What did I? What was I on when I watched this the first time? Because this is like probably his funniest movie. Like, um, I just think like this movie is just... The absurdist humor is is hilarious from beginning to end, um, and I mean Ray Fiennes is obviously giving an incredible performance um, as this character with a lot of layers to it. I think, um, but yeah, it's just you know it's beautiful to look at in the way that most Wes Anderson movies are. It has that like quirky sense of humor that he's really made his name on like jeff goldblum going to the coat check and getting his dead cat back is something that is just like i don't feel like no other director would would go for that and you know i love uh, adrian brody's like really douchebag character as well um and the see you know when they're at the the will reading or whatever and they all punch each other out that always makes me laugh um and yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a lot of fun. It's a Wes Anderson movie, right? And but it has a lot of heart too. And I think that's what I like about it. And what I like about Wes Anderson's recent films, I think he's on a really good run right now um, of movies, is that they all have a ton of heart. Um, so I like this movie quite a lot. Yeah, uh, I think that just on it, I, I agree with you on two levels. One, I think this is Wes Anderson's best movie on a uh, comedic level. I think this is just, like, I obviously, my favorite Wes Anderson movies in my top 10 Royal Ten Bombs, but uh, I think just joke for joke, this is just he's, him at his funniest. Ray Fiennes is, is giving, like, one of the great, like, straight comedy performances, uh, like, the straight face comedy performances. Uh, I think, like, Deadpan, that's where I was looking for. Deadpan <laughs> comedy performances. Uh, when he goes up to the, when he goes up to the corpse at the funeral, um, and is uh, like, oh, whatever that thing down on you at the morgue, I want some. That <laughs> line is great. There's a lot of like funny little one-liners. It's just very Wes Anderson style of like straight face silliness that I love. Um, but uh, yeah, an absolutely crime comedy. This also just. On a technical level, I think Wes Anderson's greatest looking movie, I mean, it looks beautiful, deserved every Oscar it got, like just on a production design. Fantastic pick. Jake, I like. Oh, yeah, I think uh, this is uh, this is my favorite Wes Anderson movie. I, I didn't really, I didn't include it on my list because I, I didn't. Uh, I, I think of it as more than a, a crime movie, but uh, it's a perfectly valid pick. Uh, I think the thing that the thing that I love so much about this is that uh, often people will kind of uh, nick uh, Wes Anderson for being style over substance, 
And I feel like this is the one that really makes a case for the value of aesthetics and aesthetics basically being anti-fascist, uh, which is like uh, art being something that is unnecessary that you just do it because it feels good and it 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 makes you feel good and making the world a more beautiful place is uh, uh is has value in and of itself and uh that's why i think it's wes anderson's masterpiece in my opinion i can say this without getting docked points uh so i i, I rewatched this semi recently and i couldn't tell you what it was it lost a, a, it lost a little bit of its magic it's i it's someone's second favorite wes anderson but i think just Seeing the I, this is this is my first I think of his films, and seeing it now in retrospect of everything else he's done, I think it, I think I think it lost a little bit of it and it just missed my list. But it's it's, it's literally me just nitpicking because I I think it's a good pick. It's just I thought there were ten or eleven better. Yeah, I and that. what do we do now? <laughs> I mean, I mean, you could I argue, could argue Rushmore is a crime comedy, and I would probably put that up for this. <laughs> I thought about putting, yeah. I have a different one on here. Okay, I guess. Can I just go to my four, maybe? I, I mean, oh, we, we can start an improv show, you know? I we mean, yeah, I don't here. think people just want this dead air right now, but. Let's, uh, let's sing a song. <laughs> um, okay, my number four, I guess, which I'll move on to. Um, when I talk about I, Hustle. I do, I can talk more about. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what about the great crime comedy, yeah. Cruella? We can talk about that for ten minutes. So apparently, yeah. apparently Wes Anderson uh, <laughs> thought that Ray Fiennes. Apparently Wes Anderson got to cut the stream. Well, who put Graham Budapest on this? I did. Shitty choice. Awful choice. I don't even know. Why. <laughs> I did miss, I did crime miss comedy, you, Cody. Crime comedy. You had American Psycho at first. That was a, that was a mistake. Um, and now this, uh, how many more movies are you going to make tonight? Um, did everybody else talk about Grand Budapest? Yeah. Who yeah. said positive things about Grand Budapest? I think we all like Grand well, Budapest. Well, we all <laughs> take um, We're going to move over to Scott's four, and uh, I'm going to get in a position to be on camera, so give me a second. But tell me about your four. Great. So, somehow I'm, we're back to Cody. I'm going to lose now. Um, my number four. <laughs> um, when I talked about Hustlers, I talked about how Jennifer Lopez had not really done a good movie in 20 years uh, when Hustlers came out. Well, the movie I was alluding to is my number four, Out of Sight. Um, Steven Soderbergh's um, 1998 uh film this movie is just like the definition of cool i mean soderbergh pulls that off i think in in several movies um but this movie is definitely the prime example for me and his pairing with george clooney is always a magical pairing um but really here it's the chemistry between um george clooney and j-lo from the very beginning like when they're in the, that car trunk i like i could just watch that scene for two hours of them in the car trunk just like you know, chatting about whatever they talk about, like movies for a long time. Uh, and then there's that great bit or whatever when she's in the hospital later and she's like, the, the cops are asking her, like, what did you uh, talk to him about? And she's like, oh, you know, just the usual stuff, stuff, blah, 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 movies. And he's like, you talked about movies with a, you know, this dangerous criminal. But um, yeah, they're, they're, you know, romantic chemistry and just like their sexual tension is just like, um, it's, a, it's a sexy movie. Uh, I'll fill in for Zach Ford saying that, but um, it's a very sexy movie. But the, the heist is like the crime elements of it are really fun as well. Um, and, you know, there's a great uh, sort of supporting cast as as um, Soderbergh's films typically have of just like random low life criminals. You know, you have Ving Rhames playing uh, George Clooney's buddy, but then you have a really dumb Steve Zahn. You have Don Cheadle is like the really menacing one. Um, I think. Uh, you know, he always uh, assembles a great uh, ensemble cast, and this movie just flies by. It's just like perfect breezy entertainment. Again, it's based on Elmore Leonard novel. His dialogue is always fantastic, and when you combine it with Scott Frank, who is uh, you know a fantastic screenwriter in and of it himself, um, this uh, it's easy to see why this movie got the the Oscar nomination, and maybe it should have won over Gods and Monsters. But uh, I haven't seen Gods and Monsters, so I can't say. But um, yeah, anyway, the movie's great. 
Uh, I think that I, I do really like Out of Sight a lot. I don't know if you brought it up, but uh, they're, the guy who they're trying to steal the diamonds from is Albert Brooks. So that's always a True. Problem. Yeah, that, I forgot Albert about that. Albert Brooks. So Scott Pander <laughs> doesn't matter. And it was it was a great pick. Uh, no, I like I like Out of Sight a lot. Uh, in terms, though, of uh, Scott Frank, Elmore La- Leonard adaptations that are crime comedies, I think this is the second best of the okay. uh, of them. Uh, Get Shorty is the better option, yeah. uh, but you know, uh, sure. Th- this one is good. Clooney Clooney's very funny, and this this is like it feels very proto Ocean's Eleven. Adelaide Jake thoughts on uh, Out of Sight. I have not seen it, but I'd probably love it if I did. Yeah, okay. This movie just, like, makes me feel good. Like, I put this movie on to be, like, uh, like just hang out with my old pals and out of sight. Like, I should have put this on my list. I had it on a list at one point, and somehow I was like, I don't know what to say about out of sight, but, like, this is a this is a great pick. I, for, for my mind, it's better than Get Shorty or, or any of the Ocean's movies. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I... It's a great. It's a weirdly a good hangout movie. That's that's how I feel yeah. about Out of Sight. It's it's I'll, got a lot of vibes. I'll agree with that, but better than than the Ocean movies and Get Shorty. Mm-hmm. Yikes! Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Adelaide, did you say something about Out of Sight yet? I haven't seen it. Oh, you haven't seen it. Okay. Now, Jake, you you've been you've been saying some things. <laughs> I have takes. Now, now takes time for days, to seven baby. four, and we'll see how this goes. Okay. At number seven, I have a little film by the name of Paper Moon. Paper Moon, Peter Bogdanovich's 1973 movie starring Ryan and Tatum O'Neill uh, as con artists making their way across Kansas uh, selling... Uh, Bibles to recent widows, uh, and uh, basically saying, uh, "Hey, uh, your husband ordered this Bible for you. Uh, like, uh, do you still want it? He he just died. They they're, they're going through uh, obituaries, and uh, um, yeah. Uh, so the thing about this movie is that uh, Tatum O'Neill is basically like proto Kevin McAllister in this. And uh, it's just hilarious. Like she smokes a cigarette. She's, uh, she's got this husky voice. Uh, I, I, I can't get enough of it. And uh, the look of this movie is especially uh, stunning. Uh, I listened to a uh, episode of You Must Remember This, the Karina Longworth podcast that, uh, yeah, that talked about... Uh, Polly Platt's uh, involvement in this. And uh, really, after hearing all of the things that uh, Polly Platt, uh, Peter Bogdanovich's mistreated ex-wife, did for this movie, it sounds like she could have earned herself a co-directing credit based on the fact that she decided to set it in Kansas. She found all the shooting locations. She titled the film. She found the cast. She brought the script to him. She worked on all the production design. It just seems like this is... And then you look at Peter Bogdanovich's output after Polly Platt decided, hey, fuck you, and she, he never made anything as good as Paper Moon again, even though I do like uh, certain Peter Bogdanovich movies. Yeah, uh, this, this Paper Moon is great. Uh, I would love to double feature this with Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Because while the plots are like very different, it's that same kind of 1930s, like, Depression-era throwback that as like, a crime comedy, which I think is... Movies, like, set during that era tend to make great crime comedies. Uh, great little film with Robert Redford and Paul Newman that fits under that uh, description. Uh, the Sting. Uh, but... Paper Moon is very fun. All the scenes, I love the scene where uh, Tatum joins uh, him in the Bible selling and she's able to like bump up the price even more. Yes, uh, yes. And like she I, kind of becomes in charge of the con. That is so much fun. Tatum O'Neill is just giving one of the great like young actress performances. Like right. she's so funny in this. Uh, she, she steals the movie. Uh, I almost like wonder if she should have been nominated in lead instead of supporting 
Like, right, she is the lead, one hundred percent. But like, because she's a kid, she got put into supporting, and she won. So like, that's what where it goes. But I know this movie's great. Scott Adelaide, have either of you seen Paper Moon? It came out before I was born, so no. (laughs) Fair enough. Okay, Jake, you're six. Uh, for number six, I put the fantastic Mr. Fox, uh, directed by Wes Anderson. Uh, <laughs> so the thing I love about fantastic Mr. Fox is basically everything. Every time I turn this movie on, it's like I just entered a storybook and uh, a, like a picture, a children's picture book. Uh, I find uh, George Clooney so funny in this. Uh uh, Jason Schwartzman is so funny. I think this is probably Wes Anderson's funniest movie, uh, pound for pound. Uh, I love how it uh, treats uh, death very, uh, like, for a children's movie, they're talking about death a lot in this movie. And uh, they're not sugarcoating it, which is is very true to Roald Dahl. And, uh, yeah, just the look of this movie and... It was like once Wes Anderson decided to do a full stop motion movie, it was like, ah, oh, this is what this guy was like made to do. And uh, yeah, I I can't say enough good things about it. Uh, what are your thoughts, uh, <laughs> Caleb? Yeah, uh, I think that Fantastic Mr. Fox is like pretty high tier Wes Anderson. Uh, I, I like this one a lot. It feels very much like an animated heist movie at times, which is very is. fun. Uh, it's got that Wes Anderson style of dialogue. And it just, you're right, it just looks beautiful. This is a movie, like, it just makes me think of fall. Like, and when I think of, like, fall autumn, autumn movies, like, this is one of the first I think of. The color palette in this is just so, like, warm and cozy. It's great. Uh, it, and it's got that, like, Wes Anderson style of silliness. I'm sad this wasn't a bigger hit like when it came out in theaters, but at the same time, it was never going to be. It was it's just, weird. It has too weird of a tone for most yeah. audiences. And stop motion, I just feel like, in general, is always a bit of a harder sell like to mainstream audiences. Uh, but no, this one's a lot of fun. Scott, Adelaide, fantastic Mr. Fox. Why didn't you have this on your list? You, you, hate, you hate foxes? Yeah. Fox. <laughs> like the song Clarity? <laughs> Fuck wow! You. Fuck you. <laughs> um, I uh, so again, I picked one movie per director, and I went with Grand Budapest Party. But also, I saw this movie one time when it came out. My fourteen-year-old brain was not ready for Wes Anderson. It was the first uh, Wes Anderson movie I ever saw. So um, I know that I'm probably wrong, and that I need to revisit it, and that this would be one that I would enjoy nowadays. But I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Uh, I will say though, um, like on the trend of me rewatching Wes Anderson films, this one actually went up on a rewatch. I didn't like it very much when I first saw it. Then I rewatched it like maybe like a year ago. Now I'm like, no, this is like, this is pretty good. I still prefer Isle of Dogs just because it's dogs and I love the voice cast. But this is this is a very good pick. If you needed more proof that Malcolm Lay was stuck in 2014, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Jake, you're five. Uh, at number five, I have Preston Sturge's Unfaithfully Yours. Uh, this is a movie about a composer who finds out that his wife is cheating on him. And during the course of uh, three uh, musical uh, whatever he's conducting, uh, the movie camera goes into his eye and he imagines three different ways that uh, he could handle this situation. So the first one is probably the best. That's the the one where he imagines this elaborate uh, murder plot where he's going to, uh, through like elaborate lengths to, it's the longest one too, and and he records her voice and he sets up the the door in a certain way so that things get knocked over and he's going to frame her lover and and it's it's just hilarious how how perfectly everything goes in his head like it's too perfect everyone plays into his little the actors are 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 intentionally wooden in his vision and uh it's just great the next one uh i believe he is uh very forgiving he says look 
if you don't want to be with me and you want to be with Tony here, take this money. It's I believe in love, yada, yada, yada. And then in the third vision, he uh, basically plays the victim and, uh, and uh, rages out at her or whatever. And the thing that I think this, this movie is getting at is uh, it's getting at something about toxic masculinity, empathy, and art all combined where this guy is imagining uh, these uh, scenarios playing out where like even uh, even playing the victim is like a, a toxic thing for him to do. Even, even pretending to be this high and oh, like... Uh, and uh, the thing is that in his visions, these things would never work. But uh, as he's conducting this music and he's 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 putting it into his art form, uh, it uh, it you know he's he's a great artist. And I think Preston Surges is saying something about himself. And uh, I think that uh, someone even uh, makes a comparison uh, to the the stick that he has to a, a penis at one point in the movie. And that's what I really think is going on in this movie since I've seen it like 20 times or whatever. That's that's my take. I thought I liked this movie. And now <laughs> you're, you're making me you're making me think I actually didn't. Uh no. Oh, come uh, on. I'm thankful yours. Uh you, you had yourself at a disadvantage because you picked a movie that had a remake with Albert Brooks. Yeah. <laughs> and Brooks I haven't book. seen the remake. I haven't seen it. I also I, I... haven't seen the remake. So, <laughs> the, the, the remake of The In-Laws has Albert Brooks in it, and he's great. That movie also kind of sucks. Watch the original In-Laws. There's a but, remake of The still, In-Laws? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but he's the Alan Arkin role. Uh, but uh, this one... I wasn't quite feeling it. And then we got to the actual compositions. Mm -hmm. And that's when the movie gets really great. Uh, the, the three sequences. You didn't really touch on the third one. I think the third one might be the funniest with mm -hmm. the Russian roulette game. Oh, that yes, 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 yes. So much fun. Uh, yes. Where, like, out of nowhere, he just, like, pulled up the, the gun. And just like, we're going to play a game. It was invented by soldiers, and they're like, "Oh, I've played that uh, Russian roulette. We've I yes. played that with my dad all the time. It's a card game. No, you're thinking of the wrong game." <laughs> it it gets very funny. Rex Harrison is an actor I didn't think I liked because I think My Fair Lady is a little overrated, mm -hmm. but he's very funny in this. Wait, uh, I think this like the last this. half hour. Where we see everything going wrong, he is doing some great physical comedy in this, uh, and I just think what this movie is about—it's like, it's how a thought can fester, and how like one thing that you think can kind of just snowball into this whole thing that is just going on inside your own head, and right. because it stays inside of your head. It's allowed to grow and become this giant thing. And that's what's so brilliant about this movie is we see how everything doesn't go the way he thinks it's going to. And that's what's I, I think. About. I think you're dead on, but I would extend that into uh, Preston Sturges talking about how he would basically pour that into his filmmaking uh these imagined scenarios where things go exactly how they should uh and and that's what the 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 compositions are the compositions are things going exactly how they should go uh, yeah, that, that's why i think so great absolutely yeah. adelaide so, scott have either of you seen unfaithfully yours no i have not i i recommend it's pretty good Okay, yeah, Jake, you've had, a, you've had a pretty solid list so far. What's your next one? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> at number four, this is this is the hard one. This is the one where I'm like, oh, like, I don't even want to talk about this. <laughs> uh, the number four, I picked Paul Verhoeven's L, the 2016. Oh. oh. <laughs> That's a comedy? I think so. I think this is a very satirical uh movie uh like all like all um paul verhoeven movies i think he is playing a lot with genre uh specifically uh french melodrama and uh uh 
I guess, uh, like I should say, trigger warning. I'm going to talk about sexual assault a little bit due to the subject matter of this uh, movie. Uh, but yeah, so the film opens with a brutal uh, rape scene. And right off the start, I'm like, ooh, like uh, this isn't what I I, 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 I had no idea what I was watching. I'm a big Paul Verhoeven fan, so I put it on and and ooh, like right away, this is this is hard. And uh, but then the camera pans over to uh, her cat, just kind of like casually watching it. And you're like, what is he doing right now? Like, what is this? Is this a joke right now? Like, the cat is it? It's almost like uh, mocking how this cat is just sitting there indifferently watching this incredibly uh, disgusting thing. And uh, so the movie is a mystery, but the real mystery of the movie isn't who her um, rapist was. The real mystery is why is she handling this like you would never imagine anyone would handle this? She uh, gets into a bathtub after this and orders some sushi and doesn't report it to anyone. And uh, I think Paul Verhoeven is is playing with your your uh, your movies like uh, Death Wish and uh, Taken and and all these things where where it's the perfect fantasy of what you would want to happen. And this is a movie about a very specific person and how they are dealing with this. And once you, the more and more you find out about her life, I've done some reading about this movie since I don't necessarily feel, so I'm regurgitating opinions that I have read right now since I don't necessarily feel qualified to talk about this. But it seems to be, and what I got from this movie was that this is about how Victims don't react the way that you want them to react, uh, the way that you would expect them to react. It's, this is a very specific person surrounded by a bunch of uh, Judd Apatowian like morons. Uh, Isabel Huppert is constantly rolling her eyes at everyone around her. That's the funniest shit in this movie is every time Huppert just stares someone down and just goes, ugh, like that wow. is what... <laughs> Someone that is what this in their eyes. That sure is the pinnacle of comedy, Jake. Uh, well, okay, yeah. the next, I mean, I, I have, I, what I have do you got up there? You got, you got like Holy Grail. You got planes, trains, and automobiles, and then you have L right there with them, right? Like, oh yeah, <laughs> just an absolute laugh right of a movie. I do Certainly think this is a number four. Okay, uh, okay. One more point, though. I have one more point. It's when. <laughs> Her son refuses to accept that uh, that that might not be his baby, and uh, he's she's, he's freaking out at her, and she says, "Okay, fine, it's your baby." <laughs> I just think that that's hysterical. I think she's hysterical in this movie, and I don't know, it's a rough one, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's so, basically a. Mo it's your, fine, yeah. it's your baby. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm crying so hard. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, <laughs> you have to see the movie. She's very funny. I, did, I can't. Oh, it. okay. Nope. Your time's up. Your Get time. Popcorn. Get popcorn. Up. <laughs> I did watch this movie, Jake. I'm sorry. I watched this movie. You did this. You you made me watch this movie. I watched I'm everything sorry. in the top. Seven. I should have warned you. I should have warned you. I don't know if a warning would have done any good. Uh, I, I've had this problem with like a lot of Verhoeven movies. So like, it feels like every Verhoeven movie, he does this weird Tommy was so thing where he's like, no, if you like it, you're wrong because you don't get the joke. What was the joke? What was you? You have given me eye rolls. You have given me, uh oh. It is your baby. Yes. Are, is, I can tell this movie is trying to be satirical, but satirical doesn't necessarily equal comedy. Um, mm. It's not... It, it's trying... Yes, I agree. It is trying to mirror what people think or how... It's trying to mirror the societal... Oh, victims don't act... Like this way, it's trying to analyze that from that sense. But I just, 
I, it doesn't translate to being comedy. And I think honestly, me, you telling me this is a comedy maybe hurt this movie even more because it's. I I stand by I, it honestly. I, I, I can't not laughing <laughs> once. I was so uncomfortable the entire time. Um, it's an uncomfortable I can laugh see that for this sure. Like a good thriller, but I don't see this or a good like interesting book. Like the yeah, comments are yeah, being so the, mean right now. Oh, cats exist. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, no. This, Jake, you were doing so well. I, you, were, I, you were doing real well. I, I, I think this is this is really. Help bury okay. the body. Okay. I I wish I was I wish I was there for Caleb Bowman like two days ago whenever he watched this. She's like, oh man, I can't wait to watch like a great comedy. And then first scene happens. <laughs> you just like, drop into yeah. slow motion on yeah. the floor, face of disgust. What have I done? I will say, I do follow one person who really likes who really likes this movie, and he calls it a comedy. But he also thinks Mission Impossible 2 is a five-star perfect movie, so I don't respect your opinions right now, Jake. Oh. <laughs> I don't think that, so, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I like the movie. I thought it was very good when I saw it. I thought Isabelle Huppert's performance was excellent. Um, but, yeah. that I mean, I don't disagree. Obviously, Verhoeven's films are very sat satirical for the most part. I mean, the iconic ones. Um, but I just didn't get that same feel from this movie. You you didn't think Huppert yeah. was hilarious in this. That's that's her specifically. I just think I, I, I you should you should have picked Showgirls. You, you I, might, I this is more successful Showgirls, day. basically. In my I, I'll agree with you, Scott, that <laughs> this was a well-made film on a technical yeah. level. Like it, I think I think just thinking of this as a comedy threw me off my I'm game. I'm sorry. So it's a much. weird kind of. I get yeah. it. No, I, you don't have to apologize. It'll just be reflected in your score. Uh, Adelaide, we'll go to hey, you. Okay, Bo okay, Boatman. I, I want you to sit there. I want you to remember everything you just went through watching that movie. But now I want you to just remember like how good Arsenic and Old Lace makes you feel. And you sit down every Thanksgiving <laughs> to watch it, and you're like, "Yes, this is my shit." I will say, fun fact about this though: I didn't watch the movie for the longest time because my high school did a production of it. And I just drew grew like this immense like attachment to the source material of just like see, seeing my friends perform it first of all, and see, seeing this guy who I knew like just really really well, uh, uh Halloween whatever, like B uh, Mortimer. I'm like wow, what is this? And if and I, and I watched the movie last year because of uh, you picked it in Otto Boatman, and I was just oh my god no this is this is it. I, I don't know what, like, fucking high school me was an idiot. I should have watched that day one. It's an amazing fucking movie. Absolutely hilarious. And I, I need to start taking notes for this show. I, I should have, like, remembered, like, the actual supporting cast in this film. Because every fucking one of them hits it out of the park. And they, they take these, all, every character here is so fucking, uh, other, other other than uh, Carrie Grant. Every character is, like, a little bit gray. And they, they, they maneuver that so well. And especially just the grandmothers are so fucking funny and they bring this awesome just aloofness to it all where it's like yeah we kill people but it's for a good reason uh it's this is amazing it honestly it could be higher if not the two above it existing in just perfection but this is incredible uh-oh someone didn't know a detail about a movie so we got joseph <laughs> coming in the comments <laughs> has to show off that he knows things he just Googled on himself, you know? Uh, but no, uh, Arsenic Hill Lace is excellent. This film is uh, just one of my favorite comedies. Uh, this is a film I watch every Halloween. Because uh, I think it's like, it's a, a Halloween movie, A, that you can just watch with like your whole family instead of like Saw. I mean, some people could watch Saw with their family, but that would be great. Um, but, like, no, this is, like, a, a, it's, like, a Halloween movie, movie you can watch with your family. But also, this movie's just, it's covered with, like, these spooky vibes that are just, like, it's the fun kind of Halloween movie. And I love just the insanity that gets in this movie. Cary Grant is giving, like, one of the great 
comedic performances I've seen from him. He is just so manic as the film goes on and running around. Uh, I love uh, Teddy Roosevelt charging up the stairs. So much fun. Uh, and then when the brother comes in, uh, that gets crazy. And I think maybe one of the best bits is when Cary Grant is tied to a chair and the police officer comes in and Cary Grant wants the police officer to in time. And instead of doing that, the police officer starts reading him his screenplay because <laughs> he wants to impress Cary Grant. <laughs> and it's so great. Uh, the, this whole movie is just insane and super funny. This is one of Capra's best. Uh, Capra just being one of the great comedy directors of the classic era. Uh, Scott, Jake, thoughts on our Snick and Old Lace? It's a great choice. Uh, I haven't seen it in a long time. Again, another one I haven't seen in a long time. But this kind of like madcap farce is very much like in my wheelhouse when it comes to comedy. Um, and I also think Cary Grant is just like such a versatile actor. Um, so it's one I should revisit. Oh, yeah. I, I haven't seen this one in a while uh, either. But uh, something that I, I, I really did like this movie when I saw it. It's like my mom's favorite or whatever. Uh, Something I really miss that old movies do is uh, old movies would just be like, need some comic relief? Here's an old lady. And an old lady would just come in and be like, you know, like, do some comedy. Like, bring that back. Why aren't old ladies just showing up in movies being Hashtag like... Hashtag more old ladies. Yeah, bring back the oldies. You know who's an old lady? Isabel Huppert. She could be in this. She is not. How <laughs> dare? Not How dare? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, Scott, your three. Okay, my number three is the great Spike Lee film, Black Klansman. Um, yeah, this movie uh, is one that each time I watch it, I think this is one of Spike's greatest films, uh, right near the top of the list. Um, I, I think that um, what this movie does, like, is just because, because movies about race, I feel like, are often focusing on we're going to expose how evil, malicious, blah, blah, that racism is. And of course, we all know this. But this movie is like, what, let's just show how stupid racism is, like how stupid as a belief system racism is. The fact that, um, you know, John David Washington as a, a black cop can basically infiltrate the KKK. And they can never tell the difference because the whole thing that they're using to differentiate uh, black and white people's skin color is arbitrary. Um, and I, I just think that um, it's it's a really, you know, it's maybe straightforward, but also a really smart way to look at this issue. Um, and it is a comedy. Like, I think it is a comedy. I think there's plenty of uh, funny moments in this, like when he's toying with David Duke over the phone, who obviously is, you know, played by a great Topher Grace. Um, and, you know, when he, like, takes the picture or whatever, you know, they won't touch him or whatever in the, in the photo when he's pretending, um, you know, to be the whatever he a cop at the end. And he, like, puts his arms around him right as they're about to take the photo. I mean, it's funny. It is. like, uh, And I think that's one of the things that Spike's able to do really well is he's able to get genuine comedy out of this movie without um, ever diminishing the stakes of, like, you know, the, obviously the very serious thematic material in here. Um, and, you know, like the cross-cutting between, like, the Black act activists speaking um, with the uh, KKK initiation or they're watching Birth of a Nation is like one of the most powerful, um, you know, sequences that Spike Lee, I think, has ever done. And I love the ending of the movie because he's given you like these feel-good sequences of like, oh, the racist cop gets exposed. You know, he has like the final phone call where he reveals who he is to David Duke. Um, but then, and so like, you're like, oh yeah, this was, you know, a great happy ending or whatever. But he doesn't choose to end it there. He chooses to end it with, the cross burning outside of Ron and Patrice's place. And then, you know, the real life footage of the Charlottesville riots to be like, Oh, Hey, like he lulls you into the false sense of security. Like you thought this was going to be a happy ending and that, Hey, with, this is great. Cause racism's over, but no, um, this is something we're still dealing with on a daily basis. So I think this movie is kind of ingenious. And I saw the real Ron Stallworth actually speak about the movie. Um, and he's also a very fascinating person. Um, so I, I'm a huge, huge fan of this movie. Yeah, uh, I think it was a very bold move of Spike Lee 
to take like the film's main source of tension and villainy and also make that the film's main source of the comedy. Like this movie takes like the KKK and just turns them into blithering idiots. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a very bold move that could have gone really bad and Spike is able, and like usually when it's those risky moves, a lot of times that those don't pay off for Spike Lee. I say this as someone who is a big fan of Spike Lee. It works here. Uh, it it shouldn't really, but it does. Uh, Topher Grace uh, steals a lot of scenes in this movie uh, by just coming across as an idiot. Uh, and I, I think that's the thing. It's like, I feel like that was almost the intention was to still show that like these people are dangerous, but also just how abs to take away their power by showing how absolutely stupid these people are, I think was such a brilliant move from Lee. Uh, and yeah, I, I love the, the moment when uh, uh, Stallworth tells Duke like who he really is. Mm -hmm. And Ara, you sure about that? Uh huh. Great little moment. Uh, so yeah, I would classify this as a crime comedy. Uh, Jake, Adelaide, thoughts? Yeah, I uh, I I like this movie, but I generally like my Spike Lee a little bit weirder. Like, uh, I, I I'll take Chirac into Five Bloods over this. But my favorite part of this movie, uh, <laughs> I love the Five Bloods. That was my favorite movie of the of last year. This is the Five Bloods. Uh, my favorite part of this movie, though, is at the very end, when they cut to the real-life footage, I was like, fuck yeah, yeah, for a second. Like, I was like, oh, maybe this is a great movie. And then I was, eh, it's a, it's an okay Spike Lee movie. It's, it's a little too, uh, vanilla for, for Spike Lee, for me. Uh, just for me. I, I am, I'm not invalidating your choice at all. I think it's a good choice. If you, if you hate, like... Vanilla Spike Lee. Don't watch Inside Man, then. Yeah. Oh, I love Inside Man. I, I love Inside Man. Standard for you? As the person here who's seen the least Spike Lee, probably. Uh, this is a pretty good pick. I was sitting there for a second when you said, like, wait, is this? I guess it is a comedy. Like, it, it's still going to make my list. I think it's just short, but I think on rewatches, it gets consistently like better and better. And, and I think it's one of the better screenplays of the decade. And I, I, it's... I'm I'm still newer to Spike Lee. It'll take me a while to get through all of his shit, but I think this is a great starting point. And again, he 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 laces this intense and heavy drama with really good comedy, namely, and I don't I, I might have missed it. Like Paul Walter Hauser is someone who I think carries the comedy in the film of just being this fucking idiot, but everything he says is hilarious, and it's I I, th I think again like I think again all of this list today is gonna be balancing of tones. I I think I think Lee balances it well. It leans toward the, toward the drama and the crime of it all, but I still think that the comedy works when it's there, and I think it's a good pick. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, then we will go to Jake for your three. Uh, for number three, I picked The Wolf of Wall Street, the uh, Martin Scorsese movie. Uh, I really like this movie. I know some people have kind of turned on this movie. We all know this movie. We've all talked this movie to death, you know. Uh, I just want to point to one scene uh, that... Wait, is that, is that... Before I start, is anyone going to argue that this isn't a crime movie or a comedy? Because I see Cody in there. It's, it's uh, actually... Give it a second. No, give no. It a second. <laughs> what the fuck was because you picked a good movie? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I'm really enjoying this. Uh... Yeah, uh, so I just want to point to uh, one scene, uh, specifically the scene where uh, the girl gets paid. There's a girl there who gets paid a bunch of money to shave her head. I think like fifty thousand dollars, something crazy like that. And uh, at the time, everyone's cheering it on, and and it's uh, and she's she's laughing, and 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 ah oh, yeah, money and uh, all this opulence and and wealth. And as she's laughing and as they're shaving her head, she starts crying and kind of uh, at once her head is shaved and they're all, fuck yeah. She just kind of disappears into the crowd and you're left wondering, like, where is that girl, like, in a corner crying somewhere or in a bathroom stall? Like, it, I just, I always find it so 
like kind of bone chilling, honestly. Uh, yeah. So Wolf of Wall Street. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. This is one of those movies I will say I appreciate more than I love. Because this movie is doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. It is supposed to be, it is showing you the absolute gross amount of excess that Jordan Belfort lived. And that's what the movie feels like. After a while, I get a little exhausted with it, but I understand, like, the people that, like, this is one of Tim Burkall's, like, I think it's like his second favorite Scorsese movie. And that's totally valid. Um, because I think this movie is ex- exactly what it's supposed to be doing, and I think it absolutely is both a, 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 absolutely a crime film, and it has some brilliantly funny moments. I love the scene with uh Belfort on the boat with uh, the FBI agent, uh, Kyle Chandler. Uh, when it's like, oh, you know what, these are called fun coupons. Want to take a lobster home with you? That's yeah, the fun coupon scene is great, Cody. Uh, and you also have, uh, like, Jonah Hill uh, just stealing so much of this movie. I think he absolutely deserves his Oscar nomination for this. He's great. Um, I, and the fact that everyone just calls him cousin fucker <laughs> throughout the movie is great. And the scene where he eats the guy's goldfish just, like, goes up to him, just very, like, chill, and then just... Gets on the desk and eats the goldfish. Film's fantastic. Um, again, I I find that it gets a little much for me personally, but I understand like why people love it. Adelaide Scott, you know this film isn't fantastic. Uh, I, I I rewatched this recently, uh, and obviously things have changed since I first watched it, uh, and it honestly it doesn't hold up. I, 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 I echo your sentiments, but I think I think to a greater extent. I think it, it lives in its excess for too long. And it, it gets it gets suffocating almost of just everything that he's going through. And I get I get the, the film's point of trying to point out the flaws in it, but I don't think Scorsese handles that well enough. I think he he spends too long attempt like he, he spends too long in the happiness of it where it does look like, like it's glorifying it. And by the end of the film, I just I don't I don't I don't think he succeeds in putting it down. I will say, though, uh, it is known that occasionally I write some classics over for Full Metal. And this movie alone, when I watched it a couple months ago, it inspired me to write the category, which they turned down by standby. It, it resides in, in that nice little genre. Uh, I, I, uh, some people call it, like, what people liked it in college. I call it white men derogatory because this movie just is absolutely just the the, fan, the, the fantasy of a bunch of fucking dudes who think, like, this is, this is going to be, like, their, their life. And it's so cool. And it just is annoying as shit. And hearing about it on end from film bros makes me hate it even more. I haven't seen Cats in at least like a year, and it gives and it, I I hate that I've seen it three times. I I, I think that with enough, I think this gets a lot of comparisons to the Goodfellas. I think with enough time, uh, this will be remembered as as uh, right up there with the Goodfellas. Yeah, and, yeah. Not yeah, yeah not, not better than not better than Goodfellas. Sorry. Um, but, I think so. Uh, the movie's good. I, I was going to use the word exhausting too. I think Boatman, you said it, but yeah, it just like it. It is a little bit much. Like by the end, I, I feel like it's like a great cable movie. Like you come on like an hour in or something, and you're like, you, you know, you get hooked. You watch the whole thing after that. Um, but it's just not right up there at the top for me. I will say though, it has a special place in my heart because. When my uh, buddy Ben and I did punk trial in college, before every round, we used to like before the judge would come in, we would look at each other and do the uh, <laughs> the thing, and it was uh, it always get us pumped up. So that's fantastic. Okay, Adelaide, you're two. Hey, so Bob, remember how I like had a really nice three, and I want to like play off of like my hatred for Jake's picks to like get you in a good mood. Uh, my number two is some like it high, which I know is from your favorite director or one of them at least. Uh, and it's from Coco Behold, your favorite actors. And this is a perfect movie. And I promise I'm not pandering. I sat down and looked and looked. Textbook pandering. Boatman, Cody, co fuck you. Oh. Uh, <laughs> this, this is the movie where I sat down and I was like, wait, no, this absolutely fits the bill. And the more I thought of it, it rose higher and higher on my list. And like, this is one of my favorite films of all time. I, 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 I think, I think, I think Lemon and Curtis are in incredible and they carry like this this film that honestly should have aged like fucking milk 
or something that ages worse than milk. Like it's 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 just somehow just never work. And it continues to hit after hit after hit on every watch I give it. And even Marilyn Monroe, who was who was an actress who I was told like negative things about going into like seeing more of her films, and she's amazing in this. And even Curtis balancing uh, himself and being a woman and Shell Shell, Shell Oil Jr. Like everyone is firing on all cylinders, and even being interlaced with the like, caught up in a real life crime, and seeing how the how these are chase, how the monsters are chasing him down, and even seeing the impact they have when they get to Florida and how they treat the other monsters. This is fucking incredible, and the fact that it's not my one is shocking. I don't know how the, how, how many films are better than this. This is a fantastic pick. Uh, this is I rewatched this film recently, and. This movie is still just so brilliant. This is like one of the all-time great comedies. Uh, Jack Lemmon is obviously great. He earned his Oscar nomination. And I think he's very funny. The final confrontation on the boat with him and Osgood is like just one of the great... One of the best scenes. lines ever. What, uh, that whole interaction, though, is just one of the great scenes in movies. I think Tony Curtis is the better performance here. Because Tony Curtis is doing so much. Like, him as Joe, he's, like, very funny, just more of, like, the, the, the schemer, right? But then you have him as Josephine, who I think just his voice is so good in sounding like a woman. Like, his, Lemon just sounds like Jack Lemon. Like, it sounds like Jack Lemon at a higher octave. Curtis is, like sounds like a woman. I think, like, Curtis said he called, like, Billy Wilder or somebody as the voice, and they didn't realize that it was him. And that's just brilliant. Um, And then him as, like, the Cary Grant style, Shell Oil Jr. is just so funny. Clearly, like, being a parody of Cary Grant. Hilarious. Uh, I, I think that this movie... Is great uh, and the the crime elements that work their way in. I love the gangsters specifically, like the the I don't know the actor's name, but it's the guy with the funny voice uh, who goes buttermilk. That little moment is so great. Scott, Jake, you didn't have some like it hot. Are you are in trouble? Defend yourselves. Um, I won't try to defend myself because I know that I'm wrong about this movie, but um, it just, it's not my style of comedy. Like, I'm sorry. It's, it's just not like, it's, it's very well done. Again, I, I'm not taking it away. I'm not saying, I'm certainly not saying it's a bad movie. Um, it just, it, it's not to me what it is to a lot of people, it seems. And I wish I knew why, because I love, I really like every, uh, you know, other Billy Wilder film that I've seen. Um, but uh, I don't know. Maybe it was the hype. I don't. I hate being that person that's like, well, it was hyped up and it didn't live up to the hype. Because I, I don't know. I think the great movies are like immune to hype. But um, it's just not for me. Sorry. It felt so empowering to make someone else backpedal for a change. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, oh no, I'm not backpedaling. This has always been my position. Sure, but, Scott. Yeah. Sure, Scott. <laughs> Jake, thoughts on some like it hot. Uh, I, I think it's funny when the boys dress up like girls and brand be girls. <laughs> no, nah, it's a great movie. <laughs> I, I <understand. laughs> no, yeah, it's great. I don't know. Uh, it's incredible how this is aged well. Like, it shouldn't. You explain it and you're like, oh, so that's like, that movie is unwatchable now, right? And you're like, no, it's it's it holds up. That's the thing about this movie. It's like, why 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 does this work? It it's everything about it works. I love stuff like stuff. So yeah, I don't know. I put on my list because I want to talk about it. I want to talk about Al instead. This is just the top ten crime comedies, not top ten crime comedies Jake wants to talk about tonight. Also, That's how I do Joseph, my list. <laughs> Joseph, oh yes. That that is his position. It's almost <laughs> it's it's almost like this is a show called Your List Sucks. And that we're supposed to, you know, give our opinions on the opinions. Bowman power tripping for two hours is my favorite. It's just gonna win. YLS. I, I like so this. many. I like so many movies. It's like I don't know. There's okay, lots of well, on here. here. Talk, talk about one you like. It's or no, it's Scott's turn, isn't it? Scott, it's you. my turn. 
make things better for yourself. Uh, yeah, I mean, we asked the question <laughs> earlier. <laughs> is Pulp Fiction a crime comedy? Uh, so I guess we'll answer it now. Uh, Pulp Fiction is my number two. I don't have um, a producer tonight. I'm doing this all by myself. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I love uh, every one of Tarantino's films except for one. Um, and I mean, this is this is one of the movies, most influential movies, like of all time. Like this movie changed movies, like when it came out. And this is one that, um, you know, almost at the top of the list of movies, like that I wish I could go back and see it in the theater, like in 1994 when it came out. Cause I just like kind of set the movie world on fire. And um, yeah, there's just, you know, there had never been anything like it when it came out. I'm not sure there has been anything like it on the same level of it. Uh, certainly there've been a lot of imitators since, but um yeah, it's, you know, I mean, what what is there to be said about this movie? Um, it's just like a um, incredibly entertaining, epic story of gangsters and, you know, boxers and um, comedy and violence and all of this, you know, fused together in a way that only Tarantino can. Um, and yeah, I mean, incredible characters and dialogue. I mean, it, I guess, you know, again, the question was asked, is it a comedy? I mean, I, I think it has plenty of comedy in it. I mean, I think all of Jules and Vincent's conversations are funny in that, in a specifically Tarantino way. Maybe it's not like laughing, you're falling over yourself funny, but like, I think a lot of his dialogue is funny. Um, and just the situations are funny, like John Travolta coming out of the bathroom and, you know, getting shotgunned down by Bruce Willis as the pop tarts like fly up in the air or whatever. Um, I mean, it's 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 brilliant. Um, and yeah, I mean, again, I don't, I'm not going to go on too much about Pulp Fiction because everyone's seen this and yeah. I feel like everyone loves it. So uh, th this is one of those questions, right? Is Pulp Fiction a funny crime movie or is it a crime comedy <laughs> i think it is a crime comedy i okay. think this movie is fair to call it a comedy because the jokes are so interwoven with everything that happens you can't have like the jokes just aren't ancillary like oh it's not just like there are moments where it's just oh these characters are funny people so there's some jokes in there like they're like the Marvin scene, that is so tied with the comedy. It's not like, yeah. Oh, the Marvin scene happened. That's dramatic, and then we have some comedy to alleviate. No, it's a dramatic thing that happened that is also comedic because of Vince's reaction. Uh, oh not man, I shot Marvin in the face. Actually. <laughs> Oh, shot Marvin in the face. Like he says it in the same way that if he would have spilled coffee in the car. Like that, that is inherently funny. Uh, so I think this is absolutely a, a crime comedy. This is a great pick. Uh, there's not been a whole lot of overlap tonight, which is interesting. Yeah. Adelaide, Jake, why do you both hate Pulp Fiction? So I'm going to bring back uh, the whiteboard for white men derogatory. Uh, this movie really isn't great, and I'm tired of hearing about it. Like, it's, like you're saying, I understand its impact on, on writing. And I understand that everyone in the 90s thought Pulp Fiction was the shit, and they tried to change everything about filmmaking because they want to do what Tarantino did. I don't give a shit. I just, I don't really, I'm not really invested in the characters. I don't think their writing is all that funny. I think, I, like, there's, there's no one story that I'm like, yeah, this is pretty good. It's, it's just all there. It's fine. I don't give a fuck if this is tanking my my rating at this point. I just it's it's a film that is, that's been talked to death in this community and as like film bros as a whole. And I think when you go to fucking college and every fucking eighteen year old white dude is like, this is the best movie of all time. I'm sick of it. I'm just done talking about it. Uh, yeah, it's not one of my favorite Tarantino's, even though I, I think it's a great movie. It's just. Uh, there's so many other ones that I, I like more. And and I honestly, sometimes I find uh, some of the uh, lingo a little bit uh, janky, like a, a lot of like, sure thing, daddy-o or something. And it's like, is this what someone thinks is cool? And I, I like that about it. I like the jank, but it is janky uh, at times, you know? Uh, yeah, so when, yeah, when you know. say it, but when Uma Thurman says yeah. it, it is cool. <laughs> it's clear that the world is... Both feel a little bit more like the like the seventies, and I think that that works for the film. It, yeah, and there's one great line, and it's "I'm pretty fucking far from okay." That's dope. 
I don't give a shit. That's your else. one great line from Pulp Fiction. <laughs> All the yeah. lines. Again, the one Joseph making a good point. I don't give a fuck. I, I picked my list just out of the mean bonus similar taste. We've here, all like sure torpedoed people. ourselves at various times throughout the year. Yes. <laughs> yes, We're sinking at have. equally fast rates. <laughs> I, I don't uh, know. I think I think Al was like a bomb. I don't know. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. Just... Okay, Jake. <laughs> Want to try to try to uh, stop that bomb from blowing up? Apparently not. Uh, this next <laughs> one, uh, it's like definitely most people would not consider this a comedy, but. I would 100% say if the Coen brothers made this movie exactly as it is today, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that's one of the funnier Coen brother movies. I pick Strangers on a Train. <gasps> <laughs> what? It's what's funny? Murder on a train. Why not? It's hysterical. This movie is hysterical. It is far and away... Hitchcock's funniest movie. There's nothing even close. Uh, so every character in this movie that isn't uh, Farley Granger and his uh, his uh, mistress or whatever is comic relief. The the villain of this movie, uh, Robert Walker as Bruno. I saw this with an audience. Every line he delivered, fucking killed. Like it was one of the like, it was one of the 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 most visceral audience reactions. He he's. He's uh, the whole sequence where uh, his mom is, is doing a painting and he says, it looks just like him. And, uh, she, and it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how you consider this not a, a crime comedy other than it really wasn't considered at the time because of the dark subject matter. If you made this today, you'd be like, oh, yeah, the convoluted interwoven plots and, and uh, each character is... Uh, so eccentric pat hitchcock uh, alfred hitchcock's daughter shows up and she's just fascinated by all this murder and i just i don't understand objectively how you can watch this movie and not say that it's hilarious hey, my pick here's my question for you you can this this will either hurt you or help you right now hands on screen no googling name me one joke from this movie Okay, where the old man uh, is trying to uh, stop the um, the carousel from going, and uh, he crawls under, and you see his butt, like he's this bony butt crawling under, and uh, someone says, someone should stop him. And the police officer says, do you want to do it? It's fucking hilarious. That's, the, that's one of the funniest moments. And, and it's a visual joke, honestly, but it's, it's hysterical. I mean, I, I, yeah, you, I'll you, give you that. You picked yeah. a good moment. You did pick a good moment. This is, you pick, you, even though you picked a movie I still don't consider a comedy, you picked a, one of my favorite Hitchcocks. So I'm not like going to be mad that we have a chance to talk about Strangers on a Train. I'm going to be mad that if you want a comedy that has the plot of Strangers on a Train, I know, I know, it exists. <laughs> it's Throwback <laughs> Train. It's Danny DeVito. You're too good for Frank Reynolds. Are are you too? You're too good for Frank Reynolds. I know. No, but Strangers it was in Mike Hanley's Top 100. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> probably win this episode, um, because he's not on cocaine like you all apparently are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I bet there are a lot of eye rolls in this movie. Um, makes it. <laughs> I, I've, seen, I've seen this one. This is one of my favorite Hitchcock's. I don't think of it as a comedy. I you don't, but it it, should, it, it would be today. That's not how any of this works. Um. Adelaide Scott. So, uh, for a laugh Nick, I want to know what's your, what's what's the funnier genre, film noir or thriller? Because that's fucking it. <laughs> no one does a comedy. The not only not only has the internet schooled you, everywhere proves you that you are fundamentally wrong. And I look forward to you taking the L later because I need the support. 
Mm, no, uh, genre changes with time. Hitchcock was ahead of his time with the dark comedy, and the they just didn't have the the vocabulary to label it what well, it was at the time. They didn't label those genres in 1951. They didn't, they didn't know the word if comedy. If don't list can be a comedy, so can Strangers on a Train. The fact that it's not a comedy proves you're fundamentally um, wrong. That okay, was considered look. like oh, like oh, the first dark. Com- oh my god, like. Crazy okay. old lady. It's so broad. That's why. Um, so broad. I love. I absolutely love the movie. Uh, it's my second favorite Hitchcock movie. Um, and if I had been on Villains last week, I would have put Robert Walker. I probably would have put Robert Walker's character on the list. I should have. His performance is incredible. I will always love the scene where um, I can't remember what Farley Granger's character's name is, but he goes to the um, house right. in the middle of the yeah the middle of the night because. Bruno has told him that, you know, his mother's going to be gone or whatever. And he walks in and turns on the light or he goes over to the bed and Bruno, I think it is, turns on the light and it's him laying there. And he just wanted to see if he would come through and uh, and actually go through with it. Um, and it's just like a great like twist when the light comes on and you see him there in the bed. Um, so great movie. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, like- <laughs> I don't know what my time is. Anyway, uh, so now we'll get to number ones. This is, you're all closer than you think you are. Uh, (laughs) So Bowman, I know I put two films you love below this, but I want to pitch you why In Bruges is the greatest crime comedy of all time. I I think In Bruges. Again, like my, my whole thing today has been the balancing of tones. I think this film goes for the the heaviest, the, 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 the saddest shit on my list, the most dramatic, and some really fucked up crime with incredible humor, with with maybe jokes that aren't like a mile a minute, but it is dense with comedy. How everything is just loops back and the jokes keep stacking up on top of each other. And how each joke is a setup for another joke later in the film. And that goes beyond like, I, I think again, like back to what I just like, well, there's a lot of crime. I think it balances its drama really well. About how, about how, about how uh, Colin Farrell has just done one of the most fucked up things a human can imagine. And he's wrestling with that while also being in this utterly horrible place. And he's defending himself and ignoring his emotions with comedy and lashing out uh, not lashing out against everyone around him. And Brendan Gleeson is trying to be there for him and trying to match his comedy, but it doesn't work. And, it, and it's going through that. And even when Ray Fiennes gets there, it is this intense, deep, traumatic shit that he goes through. But he maintains this incredible level, level of comedy around everyone around him and treating them like shit, that, which is character motivated. I think this is one of the smartest screenplays of the 2000s, one of my favorite films of all time. I think this, it was the first one I thought of when it's like crime comedies, this is it. This to me is the paramount of what can be done. Yeah, I can't even be mad about this. Uh, in Bruges is like, I feel like one of just the quintessential crime comedies. Like, up, Martin McDonough is up there with Shane Black in terms of those crime comedies. And this, it's not my favorite M- McDonough film, but I understand why it's so many other people's. Um, you're an inanimate fucking object. <laughs> like, it's one of the most brilliantly bizarre comebacks ever. Uh, uh, Colin Farrell just pissing off the tourists is just chasing him around (laughs) (laughs) like colin Colin farrell just navigates between like the ultimate depression and just the manic comedy which is so great uh brendan gleason is also fantastic in this film but ray fine just brings so much intensity but what he's saying is so funny this is a great pick fantastic pick uh, I'm legitimately shocked no one else had it. Scott, Jake. Yeah. If I had watched it more, I probably would have had it. I think I've only seen it once. But I, I really like Martin McDonough's. All of his movies um, have, have really resonated with me. I think um, his dark comedic styling is my type of comedy, is something that works for me. So um, I need to, to revisit this one. But, yeah, it, it's a good pick. It deserves to come up on this episode for sure. Uh, Jake? I just have one thing to say. (laughs) (laughs) 
I, I 100 expected that, and I accept it. I understand. My, yeah. Drum. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Oh, uh, yeah, no, it's a great movie. I had a lot of fun. Colin Farrell is one of my faves. Love his eyebrows. <laughs> All right. Uh, so now we'll go to Scott's one. A movie that really ties the room together. The Big Lebowski. Uh, this is in my top five movies that makes me uh, laugh the hardest. Uh, just like from beginning to end. And it's just like escalating comedy where it like starts with something really funny and just keeps getting funnier like as the scene goes on. Um, I put this on my letterbox the other day, but I watched this for the first time on a plane and I had no idea that the movie was going to be this funny. And so I, I was afraid I was about to get like thrown off of the plane or something because I was laughing so hard watching this. <laughs> um, the, the characters are just like so memorable. Um, and just like the whole relationship, I mean, the, it is a crime comedy for sure, but like the crime part of it doesn't really matter. Like the plot becomes so convoluted by the end. You barely even care because it's basically just a hangout vibes movie, um, where you're just like, you know, following the dude and, um, you know, his, his motley associates, particularly, I mean, we talked about how dumb the characters in black Klansmen are. I mean, Walter, John Goodman's character is gotta be one up there for dumbest characters in, um, in the movie, just like the way that he manages to find the stupidest way to screw everything up, um, is, is just absolutely hilarious. Um, you know, w with putting the, his underwear <laughs> in the thing and then the way that the whole car crash happens. And then my, probably my favorite scene, the one that just always sends me over the edge is when they go to the, the kid Larry's house and try to intimidate him. <laughs> <And they're sitting laughs> you see what happens Larry and they're just like absolutely berating him and Larry have you heard about Vietnam and he goes outside and starts destroying the other guy's car oh my gosh mm -hmm. uh, I mean every single John Goodman line in this is is just his and his read of them is is perfection but uh, yeah I mean that, that character alone but then you know you throw in the dude and um, all of his little witticisms and Steve Buscemi doing, you know, what he does as Donnie and the Jesus. And I mean, these characters, it just, the list goes on. Um, and I absolutely, absolutely love the movie. Um, even if I do actually like the Eagles, <laughs> I do actually like the Eagles. unlike the dude. Um, this is my favorite Coen brothers movie and one of my favorite comedies. This, this is a fantastic pick. Uh, I think maybe just one of the most brilliant scenes of all time is a scene that, on a fundamental level, probably could have been told in one sentence, right? I think you should go see the Big Lebowski and get him to replace your rug. But instead of that being the scene, it goes in all these different directions. Who are you talking about, kid? Like when Donnie just comes in? You're out of your element, Donnie. <laughs> You're... You're like a child who walks into a theater halfway. Donnie, through. I swear to God. <laughs> and all the scenes where they are bowling are <laughs> some of the greatest. This isn't numb. This is bowling. There are rules. <laughs> Just one of the great comedies. Coen Brothers do great prime comedies. Adelaide, Jake, you both didn't have this. Damn right I didn't. Uh... <laughs> So here's the thing. I looked at like this. This is absolutely not my type of movie. This is this is, this is like half a whiteboard. Uh, but I also think at the end of the day, it's a film that I don't think I would have liked in the first place because like, and I'm using I'm going to use Scott's points against him. Where just I think it's it's a film that I think was ruined because of the hype, but because I think every good line in that was shouted at me on repeat for the last twenty years. Everyone is like, oh, this film's so funny, and here's every fucking line from the movie. So when I got to there. There was nothing to laugh at. It's like, oh, hey, I've heard that joke a thousand times. There's nothing. There's nothing special about it. The one thing I didn't know is his weird fucking dream sequence, which is the, which is just out of nowhere and does not fucking work. Like this, this film just fails for me. And I understand like this is ab like this is an anti me movie. Like this film that I would I probably would never like just because of like it's not I, I don't like this type of it's film. Definitely anti you because it's like good. Uh, Jake, <laughs> you like most of my, you like nine of my fucking you're films. You're telling me you have heard people say the line, well, 
uh, say what you will about the tenets of National Socialism, but at least it's an ethos. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you're telling me you've heard that line. Men, quote. I, 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 men, I, 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 I have heard that line in real life. It probably is Adelaide's best. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. okay. Uh, yeah, so... So I I really like this movie too. I, I I understand what Adelaide is saying that like ah like people do constantly uh, repeat things from this movie and uh, I I don't know it, it does get a little old. But uh, I I love the dream sequence specifically because of the Bob Dylan song and this is the one thing in the movie that I constantly replay in my head where he says the man in me will hide sometimes to keep from being seen. <laughs> I just, I don't know. <laughs> you beautiful. find weird things funny. I, you have an odd. Bob thing. Dylan is funny. I don't you know. Confuse me. You confuse me. You'll get to know me. Huh? Uh, yeah, but you yeah, know, I, I, I like this movie, and uh, yeah, I think everyone's good in it. Yeah. Good what did you want, Jake? Uh, so yeah, my number one is uh, Raising Arizona. Uh, you probably could have guessed it because uh, only yikes! It was a yikes. Yeah, the, only, yeah. <laughs> the only thing that's I'm amazing. Only... That's amazing. That was the only yikes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Raising Arizona is my favorite. Uh, it's basically uh, like a Looney Tunes cartoon, like come to life. Uh, that the the energy of the the movie i think tarantino said that when you saw raising arizona it was like well why would you ever shoot a movie like uh they shot movies before this now now that you see that you can make something so energetic and alive and uh yeah i think that holly hunter and nick cage you, you you couldn't find better actors that can balance the comedy and the drama the way that uh, both of them did they, they they're both actors who can be incredibly goofy and big but also uh dial it in and, and be incredibly uh warm and intimate and the movie demands both of them and uh, I just throw this on all the time because I, I think it's a, a perfect movie. Uh, I love specifically how long the intro is and you forget that there's a title card coming up. Whenever that When that happens, I always forget, oh yeah, the title card's coming up and I, I just love this movie. So uh, Yeah, uh, there are some people that hate this okay. movie, some, some hosts of YLS that hate this movie. And, and Not there's this some guy. guys who can't talk about it. Uh, <laughs> what? Spence had name. it on their list, yeah. Oh, my How, how does the show work, Bowman? How does it work? Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> this movie's great. Uh, I get, like, this isn't, <laughs> I was definitely, this isn't my, this isn't my favorite Coen Brothers comedy, but it's a film that I think the more I'm airing it with, the more that I think about it, it's like, oh, this is really funny. And so I missed out on what you said, but I, I think this, this is the film like, that introduced me to Holly Hunter. I was like, yeah, she's the last girl, but like seeing her as an actress, like, oh my God, she's fucking great. And it, and it led me towards the path of wanting to watch fucking broadcast news, which you know Bowman loves. Uh, and, and I think their whole journey about getting the kids and keeping them safe and then dealing, dealing with the actual Arizona family is, is hilarious. It, and it's a film that again, like I think it gets better than what you think about it, but also just it's a film that, stand, that holds up it stands against it stands up against the test of time really well about how every time I see it, there's more and more jokes I get from it. I'm like, oh my god, this is fucking awesome. Jake, how does it feel to know that had you not had L and Strangers on a Train on your list, you probably would have won tonight. Fuck. <laughs> I feel right, strongly 50, 50, that I feel, yeah. I feel strongly about L. I'm not backing down on that. I think that movie is very well, funny. I, I'm, I'm glad you have, you, have, you have convictions on something. Uh, it may be um, uncomfortable yeah, trying to great. defend it for sure, but yeah, I, I still, when I'm watching it, I'm like, well, this is cool. Really funny. Raising, raising Arizona, though. <laughs> let me, let me talk about your good movie. Let, let me, let me, you're, you're like, I'm like, I'm about to hand you money, and you're like, ah, oh, but I want to keep talking about how I want to bug you. And I'm like, stop, oh. I'm giving you money. Uh, but no, <laughs> Raising Arizona, I think maybe has one of the greatest chase scenes. No, the greatest chase scene of all time. The Huggies chase is 
like maybe just one of my favorite scenes ever. Uh, Cause it just keeps, it's like this triple dominoes of filmmaking. Cause first you just have, oh, okay. The cops are after him. And then you still have the kid from the convenience store. And then you have all these dogs after him. And then he goes into this other department, like this grocery store. And there's a guy with a gun there. And you've got the trucker. And it just keeps escalating. Son, you got a penny on your head. <laughs> this movie, I I will constantly quote, I'll take the huggies and whatever cash you got. Uh, this movie, That's a good Nick Cage. Nick Cage. <laughs> Don't feed his ego. It's good, though. Oh, I, oh, I care so much about winning. Oh, already kill said you lost. Yeah, already said you lost. Jake is the only person here who will never get accused of pandering to me. <laughs> uh, I, I love Albert Brooks finding Nemo and Simpsons and stuff. <laughs> I put Mulholland Drive on the list for Cody. Albert thing that you bring up. But that anyway, this news is incredible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, raising your top tier uh, rate, uh, Coen Brothers comedy. Uh, Scott, you didn't have this. Why are yeah. you a terrible person? Yeah, I'm ashamed to say it, but I've never seen Raising Arizona. It's a big blind spot for me. I was choosing between three movies to watch for this. It was either this, Sneakers, or Midnight Run. And I chose Sneakers just because of the personal uh, connection that I have to it. But um, yeah, no, I this is high on my watch list. I, I think I would probably love it because I like the Cohen style of comedy and I like Nicolas Cage a lot too. So. You see, here's the thing. Most people, if they told me, I haven't seen Racing Arizona, I would get like very like, what? This is something I don't think people touch on enough. You're you. You like graduated law school and are like a lawyer. Like, <laughs> I don't know how you have time to breathe, <laughs> let alone watch movies. So the fact that you're like Thank good you. at movie trivia is legitimately just baffling to me. Um, but regardless. I could be conning you all. Maybe I'm not actually a lawyer. Well, then you're just not that impressive of a no, movie. I am. I had a trial today. <laughs> <laughs> I literally had a trial today. So. But no, no. Uh, uh, the, Raising Arizona, uh, great pick. Uh, yeah, so now it's time to wrap things up. Uh, give out grades. So, we'll, we'll start in last, because it's pretty obvious. Uh, Jake, you had, you had some good things here. You had some decent things here. You had Fantastic Mr. Fox. You had Paper Moon. You had Unfaithful Yours. That was like a really good run. And then you just shot it in the foot with L. And you kind of never really recovered. Raising Arizona, I think, of the three number ones, is probably the best number one. Uh, but still, you, know, you kind of shot yourself in the foot. You get a C minus. Uh, now we'll go over to uh, the second place, which I went back and forth with this. Actually, no. Well, yeah, second place. I went back and forth with this with a B. It's Adelaide Spence. Wow. <laughs> Damn it. Adelaide Spence. You had some great picks on here. Oh, brother. Arsenic. Some like it hot. And Bruce was a really good number one. But A, Maybe Baby driver. driver being that high and not really fitting the criteria that much hurt you a lot. And the other thing that really hurt you was the, the back sass to some great movies like Pulp Fiction and a lot of other and big lebowski absolutely hurt your chances that hurts your grade that affects your grade you know that you've been on the show i know you're wrong but i know and with with a b plus scott scott didn't really make any errors here i think like other people had like greater plays than him but scott just kind of consistently got to base hits and i think that's what got him the game scott did i use the baseball reference correct We'll talk. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to. No, you, that was good. It was good. 
I, I thank you. Thank you. Also, the streak continues. I'm three and zero in non Cody episodes. <laughs> there, there you go. We'll try to keep that alive. Uh, but yeah. So thank you to everyone for watching. Thank you to Adelaide. Thank you to Scott. Thank you to Jake. I think we made this a very fun episode. Next week, I should probably shout these out uh, if they're here. Uh, next week, uh, June, July 28th, we've got Bar on the show, movies that should be remade. And then uh, all of August, uh, it's me doing top 40 animated movies. I do have the panel. I'll announce that now. We got Mark Menchaca, Nazario Montenegro, Paulo Yama and Chance Ellison. That should be a real interesting uh, top 40. So be sure to tune in for that. Then September 1st, you have Best Cla Classic Actors Represented by One Film. With, I believe Zach Ford is doing that. And uh, September 8th, you have 2004 movies. And September 15th through the 24th, we're going back to top 100. But without further ado, thank you to all our guests for being on the show. I think we actually had a really fun time despite the fact that some of you have problems. <laughs> I know it was you, Fredo. You broke my heart. You're not gonna intimidate me. I'm entitled to my opinion. Now what will it be? Death or exile? You're hopeless. You're a hopeless mental case. You better lawyer up, asshole. Because I'm not coming back for 30%. I'm coming back for everything. Normally, I would say Auf Wiedersehen. But since what Auf Wiedersehen actually means is till I see you again, and since I never wish to see you again, to you, sir, I say goodbye. <laughs>